it it asks for everybody to give their consent and i um i'm afraid to ask for consent because what if one person says no i don't want you to record this anyway um uh, speaking of recordings i think all the recordings of all the lectures are posted i worked on last night so we've got all the lectures posted for what that's worth I mean, I don't know that, I actually don't know whether people watch those lectures or not, but I made this commitment at the very beginning of the class. I said, look, I'll post the lectures so that if you need to go back and look at them, you can. So thanks, Emily. Uh, I think they must be horrible to watch. I mean, I, I watch them and they seem, you know, the, the visual quality isn't that high. Fine, you can read the PowerPoints, fine. You can pretty much hear what I'm saying, fine, but I don't think my camera here is all that good but i don't know <clears throat> maybe if i just wipe it off so and you oh i see you run it fast good idea that's the best way then it seems like i'm not just dragging on i'm actually speaking pretty fast so anyway um it was it's been a crazy morning already just trying to deal with flooding and that kind of stuff and getting ready for class but i'm ready for class it's thursday um let's look at the agenda that's a good place to start for me because i can because i just can't get focused that's not it wow. oh this should be actually enabled this should be numbered slightly differently than this all right here i go daily agenda Oh, I think we're on the right day, day 14, July 23rd. Oh, we have got a lot of stuff to accomplish in the next week, right? But we'll do it. We're going to move right from cells uh, and just sort of do some topical stuff and go straight to tissues as fast as we can um, because we'll have be done with cells and now it'll be time to go to specialized cells. We're going to do that. So uh, I think these thought questions are still pretty good for today because we're not, we're not quite done with... Um, well, we're not done with cell organelles and uh, cell membrane strut stuff. So somebody trying to log in. There he is. Uh oh, I lost it. It's down here somewhere. Anyway, so uh, I think these talk questions are pretty good. All right. Um, pH at home lab. Well, people are working on it. People are submitting it. It's due Monday. So, you know, if you have, if you're having any issues or problems with it, I understand it's, it's complicated to do these labs at home and then try and report back your data. I hope your cabbage juice was working better than my cabbage juice. Though the second batch of cabbage juice worked pretty good. I, I think, to be honest with you, I think that when I made the first batch of cabbage juice, I made it too thick, too dark so dark that it really wouldn't change color in a distinctive way that you could recognize. The second batch, um, instead of leaving it in the, leaving the cabbage in the hot water for like a half hour, I only left it in the hot water for like 10 minutes and I still got plenty good cabbage color and I could add stuff to that cabbage color and see some pretty distinctive color changes. I mean, I put here and just right online, I put vinegar and I put ammonia and so we saw some good color changes as far as I know all my lectures are updated on YouTube we're going to be working today in the cytology one PowerPoint of course um, well wait a minute what happened there there we go okay uh, all my lectures are posted on YouTube we're going to work again continue working in the cytology one PowerPoint uh, I'm going to, I want to work on this membrane structure PowerPoint briefly i think i'm actually going to start there quiz five was due today at noon and so uh please get it to me asap if you haven't already gotten to me noon was an hour and 31 minutes ago uh -huh. quiz six is posted on d2l it's not posted on my pima yet um but i will post it on my pima the problem is i don't even know if people can get to my pima I mean, I tried doing what I did, which was toggle it to my Pima, hoping that would direct people to my Pima. But I've gotten emails that have told me that that's not what's happening. They're still not getting my Pima, and that 
I don't know. I think that's one thing I can blame on someone else other than me, right? Meaning that I um, didn't have anything to do with that weird toggling event. That was um, something that somebody at Pima College decided to do over the weekend. And uh, so I'm going to blame somebody else. I don't know who. I wouldn't name names if I knew names, but I was going to say somebody made those changes. Um, so I, I have posted quiz number six on D2L. It's ready to go. Um, it's technically due noon Saturday, the 25th. Today's the 20. Am I right about this? This is the 25th Saturday. Wait a minute. Today's the 23rd. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Saturday is two days from now, right? Traditionally, Saturday is two days after Thursday, if I recall. All right. And then uh, again, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna post exam two on Thursday the thirtieth. That's a week from today, and it'll be Saturday, August first. And I'm still working on it. And um, well, I started working on it, and hopefully, I will not have the same kind of uh, multiple choice glitches that I had uh, the last time. Okay. Uh, but anybody look at this agenda and think of something that I've completely forgotten? Uh, thought questions? I think the no, thought no, I question, <laughs> I think they're accurate. No, I think that they're, I think that these are pretty accurate. Um, but you know what? It's, it's absolutely worth checking to see if that's true. All right. Because people, some people are using the thought questions. You know, under normal circumstances, um, I feel like uh, under normal circumstances, and I don't consider these be normal circumstances. This is COVID-19 circumstances. Um, the normal th circumstances, I feel like the uh, thought questions would be uh, something I would think about more. But um, the truth of the matter is, is this where it just was? Yes. Okay. Need to get better organized, sorry. Um, So you thought questions one. Hey, okay, fine. I'm going to go the standard route here. Go to D2L. Go to the nice wet forest. I'm sure this forest is nice and wet now. Hey, where was this rain two weeks ago or three weeks ago when we needed it to put out that fire? It would have been great then. I would have had it 100% contained in a uh, uh, day if it was raining like this constantly. Okay, here I am. I'm heading down all the way down the list, way down. This is the table of contents. Uh, did you know? Here we go. Thought questions two. I click on it. It looks like nothing has happened because it's actually up here. So notice A13 goes down to secretion and excretion. We haven't gotten there today. Uh, it's, it's possible we get into some of these questions today, but I'm not super confident we will. Um, so, I'm going to just open this document and just put it in the queue and then, um, and then it, we'll have it ready for later. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Ah, I'm back. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, I think, like I say, somebody just asked me about thought questions. I think the thought questions are pretty right on for now. Okay. So this should be useful. Um, and of course, you know, when I built quiz number six, I, I built it to include information we haven't even covered yet. So we will cover 
uh, a bunch of that material today. So um, there we go. There's today's agenda. And if anybody thinks about something I've forgotten, then please let me know. You know, I know I'm the teacher, and so I'm supposed to remember everything. Uh, and what can I say? I'm a little overwhelmed these days. So if somebody thinks of something I should have said or thought of, and I haven't said or thought of it, please, please remind me. Remind me on the chat line, send me an email, whatever. I'm going to divert a little. I'm going to show you a brand new PowerPoint today. Uh, this is not a super long PowerPoint, but an important PowerPoint. Um, because we spent time yesterday talking about um, the cell membrane. And um, so here's my power, little PowerPoint on the cell membrane, cell membrane structure, and all that. And I know, as I said, I, I, I ended yesterday on uh, a slide in cyto the, the PowerPoint called Cytology 1, which was on uh, cell organelles. And we are going to go straight back to that kind of stuff for sure. But um, we started talking about cell membrane structure. And I felt like, oh, we need to talk a little bit more about cell membrane structure. So let's do it. Now, look, just take a look at this picture for a minute. And, um, and this is a picture of the cell membrane, OK? And um, all of this stuff here, I, I see this word, which is a giveaway to me, this word that says, extracellular that extracellular here means outside the cell so this whole area here is outside the cell okay and then what does this mean it means this area here is inside the cell right now, let me just escape for a minute because I want to um, put on the chat that I want to put a couple of words on the chat uh, because these are words I will use. These are words that are meaningful words. One of the words, again, is a word we just used, extracellular means outside the cell. Intracellular means inside the cell. Now, I could use, you know, we could use these in multiple different ways, right? I could say, look, the extracellular glucose concentration is higher than the intracellular glucose concentration. I could say the intracellular environment is different than the extracellular environment. Um, so just to be clear about it, these are words, though, that are um, well worth knowing. Uh, OK, so back here, slideshow, current slide. So outside the cell, inside the cell. Right. That what separates the outside from the inside is the cell membrane or plasma membrane. You might remember yesterday we talked a little bit about it. It's made of these weird phospholipids. We're going to talk about those today for sure. Plus, I mean, this thing stuck here is cholesterol. And these big blobby things all stuck in the membrane. Those are all proteins. So oh, the cell membrane. Whole cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic are surrounded by a cell membrane known as the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane encloses a cell and separates it from its environment, certainly. Cell membrane is selectively permeable, and it carefully regulates the movement of atoms and molecules in and out of the cell. So that's important. I mean, it's that the, the cell membrane is like 
the border between the extracellular and intracellular environment, between the inside and the outside of the cell, and things have to be regulated there. Now, you already know this kind of because we covered this before. There are three main types of molecules in the cell membrane. There are phospholipids, and stay tuned. We're going to talk about phospholipids, very unusual, very interesting lipid molecule. Then there's good old cholesterol, which I've mentioned before because it's there to support and strengthen. And then there are proteins, lots of proteins. Uh, I don't know. I forget when I wrote the C handout. I think I was point. I had a handout that I was using, but I'm not using it now. So don't see the handout, okay? Phospholipids. Oh man, phospholipids are crazy molecules. Very interesting molecules, okay? And these are an absolutely amphipathic molecule. Oops, I don't know what happened there. Uh, and if I forgot to put the word amphipathic on here, I'm going to. But look, look, this is a phospholipid molecule. And and this is the way it is often symbolized. And I tried to, drew, tried to draw this yesterday and did a horrific job. But it's drawn with, with this sort of round head and these two tails um, coming off of it. So what are these two tails? Take a look. These are fatty acids. These are fatty acid tails. This is a little like a triglyceride because this thing here is a, glis is a molecule called glycerol. It's one, two, three carbons long. If you hook one, two, three fatty acids to it, then you have a triglyceride, okay? But in this case, it's not a triglyceride. It's got one, two fatty acid chains. Now look, these two fatty acid chains, these are fatty acids. They are very nonpolar and they, won't, they don't like to dissolve in water. They call this the hydrophobic end of this molecule, hydrophobic end, okay? Then this end here, take a look, it is bizarre. It has phos a phosphate group in it, and this thing too, it has a positively charged um, nitrogen and it has a negatively charged oxygen. This end is charged and um, and as a, as a charged molecule, it is very polar. Isn't that bizarre? This end of the of the phospholipid molecule is polar and this end is nonpolar. Really polar, really nonpolar. That's what the way they one of the reasons they do it here. Polar head and nonpolar tails. Of course, it's a major component of the um, cell membrane. We've talked about that before. Way already. This is the fatty acid end. This is the lipid end. Lipids, remember that old saying, oil and water don't mix. It's really like saying hydrophobic and hydrophilic don't mix. All right, so... Bottom line is, is that um, this is the hydrophilic end. This end to be happy to dissolve in water because water is really polar, and this end is really polar. But this end, uh, not so much. Um, what other molecule do you know that contains fatty acids? Well, there's only another molecule we really talked about that contains fatty acids. It is uh, a triglyceride. Right? Triglycerides have fatty acids in them. Okay. Um, you know, phospholipids are very unusual lipid molecules with a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. Um, also, they contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, plus nitrogen, plus phosphorus. Remember I said before that most lipids contain just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But... Um, not a phospholipid. Honestly, at some level, if I didn't have to talk about phospholipids, I wouldn't because they're such bizarre molecules. But I have to talk about them 
because they're so important in the structure of cell membranes. Um, in water, phospholipids tend to arrange themselves in a double layer with the heads, with the head, the polar head facing toward the water and the non-polar tails facing inward into this layer away from the water, as far away as from the water as they can get. This structure, and, and you heard me use this term yesterday, it's called a phospholipid bilayer. Bilayer means two layers of phospholipids. Let me show you a picture, oops. So there's water both inside and outside of the phospholipid layer, just like a cell, hold on. I'm gonna tweak, sorry. You know me, I can't resist tweaking. Okay. All right, so here it is. This is a phospholipid bilayer right here. Now, I want you to imagine this. You take up this molecule, here it is. It has a hydrophilic head that's fine with water and a hydrophobic tail that hates water. Hydrophobic hates water, hydrophilic. You take these molecules, you throw them in a water solution, you shake them and shake them and shake them, and they actually form naturally a membrane that looks like this. And so here's the outside of the cell water. Here's the inside of the cell water. Notice that all the polar hydrophilic heads are oriented towards the water, right? On this layer and on this layer. But this stuff here is all made of the hydrophobic fatty acid tails and those things, uh, they want to get as far away from water as they can. So they're essentially trying to hide away, forming a lipid layer in the center of this membrane. You've got polar, nonpolar, nonpolar, polar. Actually, you've got polar out here, water. Polar head, interacting with water. Nonpolar, doesn't want to interact with water. Nonpolar, these are happy to interact with each other. Polar, that's interacting with the polar water outside here or inside the cell here. This entire thing is a phospholipid bilayer. And phospholipid bilayers um, are the sort of fundamental backbone of a cell membrane. Okay, just to be as clear as I can. In electron micrographs, you can sometimes get a sense of the way this membrane is arranged. I don't know, when I stare at these pictures, I mean, these, these are pictures that appear when you look for pictures of the cell membrane. I look at them and I, I really am trying to understand them better. But um, the bottom line is that, um, that, that I actually think this is the five the bilayer. This is a two-layer. Uh, this is a two-layer scenario where maybe this is the nucleus, and this is the cytoplasm, and this is the double-layered nuclear membrane. Um, you know, let me just zoom. I got to show you this image that you know it's way at the end. Oops, I went all the way back. This is a picture that I acquired just today and what it is is it's a is it's a pic it's a an artist's conceptualization a model really of um the cell membrane that's tr that is trying to be really really accurate from a molecular perspective now this is the phospholipid bilayer okay though there could be things sticking up off the phospholipid bilayer, but this is the phospholipid bilayer right here. And in fact, you know, the this part B, it's on the outer edge, this is the hydrophilic head area, and these is the hydrophobic tail area where it's red. The entire from here to here C is the phospholipid bilayer. 
Um, but this was actually taken out of an article about uh, proteins in the uh, cells of the eye. And so this protein right here is uh, what they were kind of focusing in on. This is all the model of the cell membrane, but this is the protein. And if you look at it, you can see for sure that there's these coiled helixes here that are uh, part of the secondary structure of the protein, which is an alpha helix. <laughs> and uh, how that alpha helix works in the retina, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not that far into the article. I just thought it was kind of an interesting image of a real, um, of, uh, uh, of them trying to really approximate the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. Phospholipids, cholesterol, proteins, phospholipids, we're back there again. You know, I have to tell you that a molecule like this, a phospholipid molecule like this, is of course something that you um, will, will have in your body. Um, I am going to go here, just going to insert one here. This particular one, I'm pretty sure, is a... Um, phospholipid called phosphatidyl. Uh oh, I better be careful about my spelling here. Phosphatidylcholine, and its its sort of commercial name, believe it or not, is lecithin. You can sometimes see it on the supplement shelf. People buying phosphatidylcholine uh, and eating it as a supplement, which seems a little strange to me. Since you have to have, uh, I mean, trillions and trillions and trillions of these molecules in order to just put together a basic cell. And so I'm kind of thinking if you take one little pill, how is that going to possibly help you? Right, you're taking one little little supplement capsule this big of some extra phosphatidylcholine to help you with your cell membranes. Well, my gosh, if you can't make enough phosphatidylcholine to form your cell membranes. Forget it. You're doomed. You're just like a blob on the floor. So I can't see how this one little capsule would help. But anyway, where was I? I was ranting and raving about something. So I added that in the name of this phosphatidylcholine. I think I spelled this right, believe it or not. It's called lecithin. Now, what I was saying when I started thinking about this is that you know what kind of molecule in your home looks a real lot like this molecule? Soap. Soap molecules look a real lot like this molecule. So if you're using laundry soap or dish soap, probably got phospholipids in it. And what's great about that is that when you're trying to clean things, this end will be attracted to water and will try and dissolve in water. These ends, well, those are going to be attracted to oils and fats that um, might be uh, making your clothes dirty. I mean, our bodies secrete lots and lots of um, oils all the time, skin oils all the time. And those dissolve in our clothes and those can be broken down by bacteria. And that can cause some of the funky smell of old clothes. But it's hard to get those oils out of clothing if all you use is water. Because remember, oils and water, they don't want to mix. So you could throw a dirty, nasty shirt in plain water and it would, you know, you could shake it and shake it and spin it and spin it and you probably wouldn't get hardly any of the actual oils out of the shirt. But if you have a molecule like this to help you, this end will dissolve in the water and this end will dissolve in the oils in the shirt and then you shake it, shake it, shake it, spin it, spin it, spin it, and it pulls some of the oils right out. It's an amazing story. 
like I said, this is kind of an unusual molecule. Um, and uh, all right, there we go. Cell membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules like gases, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, these are hydrophobic molecules, really. Um, they, they're non-polar molecules that, um, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that none of them will dissolve in water. They're not huge fans of dissolving in water. Um, water can get through a cell membrane by using a special protein pore called an aquaporin. Ions and large molecules cannot get through without help from a protein carrier. So gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen go through easily. Water goes through easily because it has a certain pore that's designed just to help it get through, right? Ions and other large molecules cannot get through without help from some kind of protein, and I put it in quotes, carrier, meaning some protein that helps get them across the cell membrane. So if a cell wants ions, or it needs to get rid of ions, or it wants large molecules, or it needs to get large molecules, it's going to have to build proteins to help it do that. So the other cell membrane components include proteins. Uh, they help structure the um, they help structure the membrane. Of course, they're involved in transporting things across membranes. Then there's cholesterol, which is part of the structure of the membrane. It supports the membrane by stabilizing the fatty acids. Uh, then there are things called glycolipids and glycoproteins. These are, um, the glyco tells you right away that this is um, like glucose related to some kind of carbohydrate. I mean, we've talked about carbs, we've talked about lipids, we've talked about proteins, but we haven't talked so much about molecules that are mixtures of those two. These are examples of mixtures of uh, carbohydrates and lipids, carbohydrates and proteins. And these carbohydrate chains tend to be sticking off the edge of the cell and serve purposes uh, in the extracellular environment, like cell recognition, right? I mean, it's these kind of glyco, uh, it, it's these glycolipids or glycoproteins that label uh, cells uh, as being cells of the body or of, as being um, a particular kind of cell within the body. So the membrane is a lipid bilayer. Again, here's the, here's the phospholipids. Here's some, there's a phospholipid bilayer here. Here's the hydrophilic head, hydrophilic head, hydrophobic tails. Um, here's, here's cholesterol embedded in the membrane. Protein, protein, weird spiral coil protein, proteins, proteins. I mean, some of these proteins uh, could represent enzymes. Oh, there's all kinds of things uh, that these proteins could do when embedded in a cell membrane. Now, we sometimes call the cell membrane a fluid mosaic, okay? The phospholipids are studded with proteins and cholesterol. It forms what they call a mosaic. It's kind of like a collage, like a collage of molecules. And, uh, and so there's where the mosaic parts. The molecules move around past each other in the membrane. They're, they're kind of fluid. So really, when we look at this model, this model of the cell membrane, we are looking at what's called the fluid mosaic hypothesis or the fluid mosaic model of membrane structure. And there it is again, the fluid mosaic model of membrane structure. Give me a second. Parker? animals that needed to be well directed let's put it that way my dog is kind of got uh, a very young cat sort of pinned in an area and i can tell she's not happy i can hear her uh, growling at him anyway she's he's gone now so she can escape all right well let's talk about proteins in the cell membrane 
There are lots of different kinds. They have lots of shapes, lots of functions, of course. There are transport proteins. That's an important kind of protein that we find there. They provide channels for the movement of molecules back and forth across the membrane. Huh. So just analyze this picture for a minute, if you would. And you'll see here's a phospholipid bilayer. Right There's the hydrophilic heads, hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails. These hydrophilic heads are interacting with this solution out here, which is a water-based solution. These hydrophilic heads are interacting with this internal solution of the cell, part of the cytosol that is, um, is, yeah, that is also based on water. So water-loving end, water-loving end, water-fearing end is hiding in the middle. But then this protein, take a look, it's embedded and it sticks right through the membrane no problem and uh and in this case you can see some solute molecules that are going to work their way through uh, the cell membrane by moving through this transport protein there's lots of different kinds of proteins um some proteins are not very selective but most are pretty selective Parker, stop harassing her go ahead go out so anyway, this is this is just supposed to show a um, a membrane protein that's opening and closing in order to move um, uh, molecules in or out of the cell. And in this particular case, well, we're going to talk about membrane transport in the pretty near future. Now, this particular protein is one that's called an aquaporin, and its entire job is to help water move through the membrane. It's critically important that water move in and out of cells uh, without any problem. I mean, water is just such an essential molecule that um, you absolutely has to be able to move freely through the cell membrane. And, and for a long time, it wasn't well understood how water could do that. Because after all, water there's a layer here this layer right here is all lipids so it's like the central core of the cell membrane is a lipid layer and how can water move through this lipid layer and, and the answer is it wouldn't move well through that lipid layer but water it was clear from experiments that water did move very easily and so that suggested now, one hypothesis to explain it was that there was a special pore for water, and they've now found that special pore, and they have um, and they have studied it pretty well. And uh, again, if it's something you were interested in, you could look it up on Google and see lots of cool things about aquaporins. Um, there are receptor proteins, and a receptor protein. Remember the word receptor is re, re it is related absolutely to the word receiver. Like it's a receiver something. A receptor is a receiver. Um, so there's a protein right here that has a very specific binding site for some molecule to get stuck in it. And once it gets stuck in it, well, it can maybe be moved through the protein or it can be, um, it, it can be moved through the protein or it can be, um, <clears throat> cause a change, uh, you know, cause the uh, something else to happen because it's attached into that binding site. Um, so these receptor proteins um, will attach only to very specific molecules. This is very three-dimensional lock and key kind of thing. And, and it will hook up with specific molecules, which initiates a chain reaction inside the cell called cell signaling. So in a cell signaling event, a molecule locks into this binding site and causes this enzyme, this protein to change something else inside the cell, and it's like a cell signal. So again, here is this yellow is the cell membrane. This is the protein receptor. Here comes uh, a molecule that's designed to fit in it, in this case, epinephrine. And that causes a bunch of chemical changes inside the cell, okay? Um, that, for example, could 
uh, break down glycogen and release glucose for energy. So not a bad little picture of that kind of event. Oh, there are enzymes embedded in the uh, membrane, in the cell membrane for sure. And those enzymes that are embedded there, of course, they're there to do chemical reactions and to make chemical reactions around the cell happen faster in a more coordinated and regulated way. Uh, that you can't say enough about how important enzymes are in um, creating the conditions for life. And of course, enzymes can be floating around inside a cell, but there are a significant number of enzymes that are actually stuck right in the cell membrane. That's where they will spend their entire molecular lives. And um, all they will do is be involved in breaking molecules down or building molecules up. Uh, so we've got enzyme activity, um, signal transduction or the, the um, movement of a signal in the cell that's been caused by a, a receptor molecule. Or you can have proteins that are just a transport kind of molecule, very three-dimensionally specific for sure. Then there's anchoring proteins that can anchor cytoskeletal proteins inside the cell. I mean, these filaments that you see here are an important um, part of the cell structure. Cytoskeleton uh, is a very dense arrangement of protein tubules inside of a cell. And, um, and uh, the bottom line is, is that this is a way you can attach those proteins to the cell membrane. And again, sometimes those cytoskeleton proteins, they have no choice. They must pull the membrane, move the membrane, whatever. And so the first step in that process is attaching them to the membrane. So uh, I don't know. Here's an interesting group of molecules called glycolipids. And glycolipids um, are kind of famous because they have a, um, they have a protein portion, sorry, glycolipids. So they have a, um, sorry, I said this wrong. Look, these are not amino acids. These are six carbon sugars. And then this thing here is a fatty, these are fatty acids. So it's glycolipid and they're embedded in our cell membrane. So the O antigen, the A antigen, the B antigen, these are all part of uh, what are called is called the ABO blood typing system. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. The ABO blood typing system. All right. So let me just tweak that a tiny bit. The ABO blood typing system is the system in which you have blood type A, blood type B, um, blood type AB, or blood type O. So that's just one blood typing system. There's actually um, <clears throat> lots of, um, there's, there's a number of different ways to type blood, and this is absolutely only one of them. All right, so glycolipids are important in creating blood oh, Go ahead. Oh, just that caught my curiosity. I, uh, I've never heard about other systems for typing blood. Do you know how many there are? Uh, there's like 26 systems. Wow. Believe it or not, there's, there's the, well, we, most people know about the ABO system. So people will say, oh, I'm blood type A positive. Yeah. They'll say that. I'm blood type A positive. And so the A is the ABO blood typing system. And then the yeah. positive is the rhesus blood typing system. But then there's all these other blood typing systems that we don't think about very much. Um, oh, so the positive and negative isn't 
ABO. That's a second system being that's used in conjunction. Yeah, that, that's a second system. It's called a rhesus system. And um, in the rhesus system, it's, it, was na it was first discovered in rhesus monkeys. So they call it the RH factor for rhesus. But it is, um, it's a system in which it only has two. You can either be positive or negative. Um, so there's a, a gene for positive that creates the rhesus protein, and there's a, ne and the, a gene that's negative. It doesn't create the protein. And um, again, you, um, if you get a positive from your mom and a positive from your dad, you're going to be positive. You get a positive from your mom and a negative from your dad, you're still going to be positive because uh, positive is dominant over negative. And then if you get, oh, you're only going to be negative, you get a negative version of that gene from your mom and a negative version of that gene from your dad. But you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, even though it's a system we don't think a lot about, um, pregnant women think about it because if a, if a woman is negative, if she's rhesus negative and she uh, and her baby happens to be positive, then um, she can start creating antibodies that will attack the baby's blood system. And, and so, you know, it is sort of true. I remember, I just remember this when I was growing up, people were like, well, we're going to get married, we're going to get a blood test. And you always sort of thought, oh, well, you're getting a blood test to see if you have like syphilis or something. But no, uh -uh. you were getting a blood test to see whether you were positive or negative in the rhesus system. And um, and that's because again, if it's a, if a man's positive uh, and a woman's negative, then the, the, the it's certainly possible that they're going to produce a child that is positive, and that that child that's positive could create an immune reaction um, uh, because it, it has that different blood type in the womb. But, but to go, just to go back to the original idea, most of the time they don't worry about that. But when they're thinking about like matching organs for transplants and things, mm -hmm. they are going to try and match as many of those different tissue types, blood matching systems as they can, because every one of them, they're kind of cumulative. Every one of them could cause a rejection response or something like that. So well, the ones we hear about the most are, of course, ABO and the rhesus system. Like I'm O positive, so um, and that's probably the most common blood type. O positive. Is. Anyway, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so anyway, I just thought that you know I just wanted to mention these blood type again. Most people sort of know something about the ABO blood typing system. I, I don't, you know, when I was younger, and this was sort of this was really pre. Uh, HIV and AIDS, right? We would do blood stuff in class, believe it or not. Um, when I was growing up in sixth grade, well, I actually got, believe it or not, I got expelled for a week in sixth grade for taking blood from people. I was making blood slides, and I was also typing their blood for them. But, you know, they would type... Um, they, they would sometimes type blood in science class, and you would get a little tiny lancet and stick yourself, get a couple drops of blood. You type your blood, and everybody knew their blood type because you, you, you did blood typing, you know, as kind of a regular thing and as a, you know, high school freshman or whatever. But now, of course, they completely and totally stopped all of that uh, when they started to be aware of blood-borne viruses like human immunodeficiency virus. And I mean, nowadays in my classroom, in the classroom at Pima, they they don't even want us to use uh, to do uh, DNA extraction from human cheek cells because that involves, believe it or not, human spit, and human spit is now considered a biohazard. And this was pre-COVID nineteen. Of course, we consider it a biohazard now, but pre-COVID-19. So they were like, no, nah, come on, we want you to use strawberries for your DNA extraction. We don't want you to use human spit. I mean, that is like uh, a biohazard. So anyway, I think these days people don't necessarily know their blood type. Many people I ask, they just don't know their blood type because they've never been in a situation where they were allowed to type their blood in science class. 
and honestly, I, I kind of can't imagine how, what the chances are you would catch some blood-borne virus when you're doing your own blood typing. But anyway, ah, I'm getting off the track. I hear this in reviews. Mr. Mackey gets off on a tangent. Well, okay, I'm not getting off on a tangent here. Though, I just wanted to mention that glycolipids are important in creating ABO blood typing and these other blood, uh, other tissue matching tissue systems too. So, also true, they're involved in cellular identification, like knowing which cell is a cell of your body and which is not, which type of cell that you are. I mean, again, immune system. I mean, look, we live in a world um, where, uh, where we have this big, moist, nutrient-rich body and there are certainly hundreds or thousands of organisms that would love to um, colonize our body and try and harvest our resources. Um, I'm talking about bacteria, funguses, uh, plants, animals. I mean, probably in every other kingdom, there are organisms that could potentially be parasitic or infectious or whatever. They would love to get in our body. So we have to have a whole immune system it's constantly doing surveillance, looking for foreign invaders. And one of the ways that the immune system understands if something is a foreign invader is literally there are white blood cells that will can't touch cells of the body and, um, and they will look for the cellular identification. If they see cellular identification that says this is of the body, then they're supposed to leave it alone. Don't harass it. Don't abuse it. Don't kill it. It's a, of, it's a cell of our body. But if they discover cells or other structures that are clearly not of our body, well, then that can initiate an immune response. And that's what has to happen in order to keep us from, you know, just constantly being colonized by uh, creatures that are you know, interested in harvesting our resources. It's a big story in biology, the, the harvesting of other organisms' resources. Anyway, so just to mention, those glycolipids can also be involved in cellular identification. And then, I don't know, here's this picture, like I said, that I just acquired today that is, um, you know, a model of the cell membrane. Um, I want to go back and just make sure uh, that we're that everybody has an opportunity to ask me any kind of questions about um, cell membranes okay and really the, there's one thing i'd like to mention and i think this is exactly the place to put it where it says see handout is this um Fluid mosaic I'm just going to call it the fluid mosaic model. Now, nah, too complicated. So oh, what I want to point out is that even though we're studying this, the cell membrane, the cell membrane, we're pick, taking a picture of the cell and we're looking and seeing that, um, you know, it, we're surrounded by this membrane, but this membrane is the same kind of membrane that you use to build rough endoplasmic reticulum or the uh, nuclear membrane of a cell. So it's not, it's not just the membrane that's on the outside of the cell. It is also all of the membranes that are important in building organelles inside the cell. 
All right, so I've tweaked this. Uh, I'm going to end up calling this, I think, not not document 25 cell membrane structure. I re I numbered this wrong. I was thinking about sticking it on my PIMA and the numbers that are there. I'm also going to call this cell membrane structure PowerPoint dot one for the edited version of. Cell membrane structure dot one, so we know that it's the version that I just tweaked. And I will, of course, post it because I know. I mean, people email me all the time and they talk about how they show these PowerPoints during dinner, their entire family, and how it, it just initiates these great discussions about the fluid mosaic model and all that. So uh, I'm going to post it so you can, you know, discuss it with your family at dinner tonight. Um, anyway, uh, okay, this I know was a little bit of a diversion, I, I agree, okay, but I will post it because I want everybody to have access to it. This is a little bit better opportunity for me to show you about the structure of the cell membrane, okay? I'm going to shrink this one down here. How many PowerPoints do I have down here now? Okay, here's the next one that's going to go up. And um, honestly, I, I want to – we've already covered an awful lot of this PowerPoint, not all of it, but um, I want to actually boom through to where I think we left off yesterday. Oh, I should have updated this. I'm going to keep coming back to this again for sure today. I should have, when I said update it, I really mean it. I just feel like I need to tweak the imagery a little. I think I could darken it uh, and and clarify it. It might make it a little bit more readable on the PowerPoint. All right. You know what? This is a good time to take a break. I mean, I know it's not exactly 2.30, but I, before I get into this stuff, I feel like I need to get up and stretch my legs and move around. I'm going to have to swim out of here. But um, but anyway, can we take an official 10-minute break? And when we come back, we'll just jump right to this slide and start working on it. Okay, everybody? This is your opportunity to get up and stretch and move around a little bit. Run to the restroom, okay? 10-minute break.
<laughs> oh, all right, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like a it's like a swamp in here, and I I unfortunately moved started moving around the house, and I realized, uh oh, getting distracted by the flooding stuff again. Again, I will deal with that when we uh, when we're done with class today. But it's still distracting, needless to say. All right, is everybody still here? Is anybody still here? Let me check the chat line to see if um, anybody's chatted anything. No, no chats. Okay. If a question comes up, yes, go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying I'm still here, but also I do have a question. But um, but um, I'll, I'll actually never mind. I'll ask it later. No, it's it's about the lab. I'll I'll ask it later. Okay, we'll get we will talk about the lab. You're talking about the uh, gummy bear, the yeah. the yeah. osmosis lab, mm -hmm. or the pH lab. The osmosis, the one we were supposed right, to read good. yesterday. Good. Look, look, we'll talk about the lab for sure um, later today. No doubt about it. So save your question if you wouldn't mind. All right, so we're back here again. Remember this big complicated? Uh, I don't know how complicated it is, but um, I was using this yesterday to. Um, try and integrate some of this information about um, about the uh, activities of these organelles. I mean, look, I could just throw you a chart and say, look, just memorize this chart. And um, and I showed you that chart and I told you, well, I told you, I used to say to people, memorize that chart, but these days in the era of COVID-19 and no proctoring of exams and everything else, I think that's the open note, open book. Um, I, uh, nobody has to memorize that chart. But the bottom line is, is if you remember the chart I'm talking about is this chart. And this chart is packed full of lots of great information about cells and organelles. And of course, I, my drawings probably leave something to be desired. But, um, but I will show you some electron micrographs of cell organelles today, just like I did yesterday. But I want you to remember, remind you that there's numbers on here, and these numbers, they correspond to numbers on this document. So number one was the nucleus. Number two was the nucleolus. Number three is rough endoplasmic reticulum. Number four is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Number five is the Golgi complex. Number six, uh, where is number six? I forget what number six is. Anyway, um, but so then number eight is um, eight is mitochondria. Number six and seven are lysosomes and peroxisomes. I just spaced that out for a minute. But the bottom line is, is that instead of talking about just kind of working our way down that chart, which I think would be even more boring than what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to sort of paint a picture of activity inside the cell. And certainly there are hundreds of different cellular activities that we could talk about. But in the context of this class, one of the most important ones is this idea of how these organelles are linked together by um, some process. And in this case, the process that they're linked together by um, would be protein synthesis, right? The production of proteins. And you probably remember yesterday I said, look, cells need to make 30,000 different proteins, 30,000. And so there's an awful lot of this particular process going on. And that process, of course, starts in the nucleus right? Because there's where the DNA is, and the DNA has the recipes, and the DNA, ooh, he's playing with the writing thing again. The DNA is going to be transcribed, whoops, going to be transcribed uh, to form three types of RNA, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. I talked about all of these yesterday, but remember I stuck this document in here too, which talks about the three famous types of RNA. I said this yesterday, there's more than three types of RNA for sure, but there are three really famous types of RNA. Okay, so there they are, messenger RNA. This is the actual copy of the recipe. Ribosomal RNA is going to form an organelle. That's this organelle right here right? The actual ribosome, organelle number nine. Um, that ribosome in this case is attached to this 
folded membrane, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And we looked at rough endoplasmic reticulum in an electron micrograph yesterday. Um, so it's part of the immortal lecture from yesterday, which will forever be posted on YouTube so my great, great, great grandchildren can watch it. Anyway, um, uh, I doubt they will. But then there's transfer RNA, and the job of transfer RNA is to go out and find amino acids. So when you see me using AA like this, it doesn't refer to Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that. It refers to amino acids. Why do we need to gather up all the amino acids? Well, because when you make a protein, you're going to hook amino acids together using a peptide bond to make a polypeptide or protein. Okay? We talked about all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I don't think drawing is a very good idea for me. Uh-oh, what did I do there? Didn't do what I wanted to do. Um, I don't think drawing is a good thing for me. Uh-oh. Okay, good. I think it's better for me to use a cursor because when I start drawing, it's just a total mess. But, you know, i got to just divert myself a minute to this organelle right here. This organelle is organelle number eight. Organelle number eight is an organelle called a mitochondria. Mitochondria are really the, um, they're the places in a cell where most of the energy is transferred to ATP. So ATP is formed, most of the ATP in a cell is formed in a mitochondria, right? Oh, the plural is mitochondria. The singular is mitochondrion, but honestly, I don't care if you use them interchangeably. It'd be fine by me. But the bottom line is, is that really, one thing I wish I could write over here under cellular respiration is 95% of the cellular respiration that happens in a cell. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Forget it, 95%. That was the worst 95% I ever wrote. Anyway, 95% of the- I'm sorry, um, what, what is cellular respiration? Ooh, oh good, thanks for asking. I'm, I'm very happy. Let me, can I, I'm gonna go to the chat line and I'm gonna write it in there, okay? So everybody who wants to take a note on it can take a note on it. Now, we haven't talked in great detail about cellular respiration, but we talked a little bit about it. I put it on the chat line yesterday, but let me write it again because this is a, a, a super important biochemical pathway. Maybe remember what a biochemical pathway is, is it's a long chain of reactions with some end result. And the end result is probably where we're heading, but you can't just make it happen in one reaction. You need 30 reactions to make it happen. So cellular respiration is the biochemical pathway that describes how energy is extracted from food molecules and transferred and transferred the good old ATP. Why? Why ATP? Because most because cell energy molecule, machines, right? yes, you bet, most cell machines actually run on ATP period. Here it is. Here's my uh, description, okay? Cellular respiration is the biochemical pathway that describes how energy is extracted from food molecules and transferred to ATP. Most cell machine machines actually run on ATP. You can't run cell machines on glucose. 
It's like glucose is like jet fuel. There's like 80 ATPs worth of energy in glucose and no cell machine can run on that. So what you have to do is you have to carefully take the cell, the glucose molecule apart and carefully transfer the energy from the covalent bonds in glucose to the covalent bond, the high energy phosphate bonds in ATPs. Little pieces of the energy go into ATP. Then the ATPs leave the mitochondrion and go wherever in the cell ATP is needed, right? So they're constantly moving out of the mitochondria and into the cell to run cell machines. Now, I want to be clear. Usually, when we think about cellular respiration, it looks, it, it, the equation looks something like this. Okay, glucose plus oxygen is broken apart to form carbon dioxide plus water, okay? Glucose is made of what? Carbon, hydrogens, oxygens. Water's made of what? Hydrogens, oxygens. When you start rearranging and tearing them apart, what you're going to end is carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. That's what you have over on this side. And, but here's the thing. The re whole reason we do it is to take the energy out of the glucose molecule and transfer it to ATP. So we're tearing this glucose molecule apart in a very careful way to transfer as much of the energy as possible from that glucose molecule into ATP. That's it. We, um, we can carefully disassemble it and transfer the energy. Look, if you, if you put gasoline in your car, that gasoline is pumped into a metal cylinder and it's mixed with oxygen and it is ignited with a spark and it explodes. And the energy that is released is used to move, this is where my, my knowledge of cars is gonna fall apart, right? It's used to move that piston. So the piston comes down, and there's an explosion, moves it up, the explosion creates movement, and that movement is transferred to all the other movements that make your car run, as far as I know, right? You have a battery-powered car, a whole different story. But if you've got a regular old internal combustion car, like most people do. So in that case, you can just explode the organic molecule and as much energy and, and the use all the energy in that explosion to um, do what you need to do. But you can't do that in cells. You can't be exploding molecules. Now, the other thing I want to say is, look, is it only glucose? No. Glucose is the classic way to look at it because lots of it is glucose. An awful lot of it is glucose. But you know what? You can get energy out of lipids. You can get energy out of proteins. You can get energy out of nucleotides. You can get energy out of other carbohydrate molecules. Not just glucose. But, you know, we're looking at the standard thing. So, Sorry, I went on and on there, but cellular respiration is really um, it, it, it's like the most famous and important catabolic biochemical pathway because without it, life wouldn't exist. Without that energy, we couldn't possibly put together life the way life is on the planet Earth. Right? So, so I appreciate the question because... Um, we are talking about it, that, that kind of stuff, right this minute, okay? And when I say that, I'm going back to here. We're talking about mitochondria and the mitochondrion. This organelle here, it has an outer membrane, and then it has this really folded up inner membrane that creates a huge amount of surface area in here for chemical reactions. And the chemical reactions, the complex chemical reactions that happen around this inner membrane are... Um, the ones that are going to generate ATPs so that the cell can, you know, run, okay? It says here it's a bean-shaped or cylindrical organelle with double membrane structure. The inner membrane is heavily folded, 
and its function, cellular respiration. And what I tried to write here was 95% of the ATP that's generated inside of a cell is generated in a mitochondria. Uh, To just automatically have a, a one single crazy great image of every um, ordinelle here, but I don't. Darn it. Ooh, I am going to have it in a minute. Sorry, taking up time organizing my life here, but look, here's where I, why I did all this. Can everybody see this? I, I think I'm I think I'm presenting and everything else. So here is a pretty nice picture of a mitochondria, and I've got several here, right? This looks like smooth endoplasmic reticulum, this looks like rough endoplasmic reticulum, but here's a mitochondrion. And um, notice there's this outer membrane and this folded inner membrane. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. Well, you know, all of these images are okay. I want to show... Um, I mean, here's a nice mitochondria, and this one's kind of roundish, right? But do you see the outer membrane? Here's the inner membrane. This creates multiple compartments inside of the mitochondria. And then this particular image is kind of a cool one because what this is showing you here are a whole bunch of mitochondria that are, um, you know, in this area next to a capillary. And I mean, you can just see they are just stacked in there. Mitochondria and mitochondria and mitochondria. And so I'm, I'm assuming that this particular part of the cell is really, um, is really involved in, um, there's something going on there that requires lots of energy. And you know, you find lots of mitochondria in places that require lots of energy, like skeletal muscles are just packed with mitochondria, heart muscle cells packed with mitochondria. Okay, so I diverted over here to mitochondria, and I'm happy to answer any questions people have about mitochondria. I was all talking about this area, and then I went, mitochondria? Well, that's because, look, everything I'm describing, transcription, translation, the assembly of this, the movement of molecules, all of that requires energy. Very little of this stuff happens in some like, you know, cosmic, uh, non-energetic way. No, cells are like factories. When things need to be moved around inside a factory, you get a forklift, it runs on energy. When things need to be moved around in cells, there are motion molecules, and those motion molecules require energy. So, you know, if you're going to tear a molecule apart, it takes energy. If you're going to put a molecule together, it takes energy. If you're going to move a molecule around, it takes energy. So I can't kind of think that without mitochondria, and lots of them, cells can have hundreds or thousands of mitochondria without them, there simply wouldn't be enough ATP to make all the other stuff happen. And if you run out of energy, that's bad. Cells will die. A cell runs out of energy, it will die, right? When we are born, well, not, not that, I'm going to put it, bit. when we are first formed, sperm, egg, fertilization, we are instantly addicted to energy. 
we cannot survive without a continuous energy source, all right? Um, and so that's just the nature of cell life and therefore unicellular, multicellular life too. Okay, sorry, I diverted over here to say energy, energy, energy. All of this stuff takes energy, just so you know. Now, um, all of these types of RNA were all converging over here on organelle number nine. Organelle number nine is the ribosome. And, organ, and, and ribosomes are where all, as far as I know, of the proteins in a cell are manufactured. They're manufactured on ribosomes. Ribosomes are part of the manufacturing process. Again, messenger RNA is like the recipe. Ribosomal RNA is like the mixing bowl. And transfer RNA brings the amino acids over there. So you've got the recipe, which tells you what amino acids to put where. You've got the mixing bowl to mix it all up in. You've got the amino acids, fortunately, because transfer RNA is bringing them to you. And then over here, they're going to eventually get put together into proteins. And I will talk about that, but not today. Now, you notice that I attached all these ribosomes to this piece of folded membrane here called rough endoplasmic reticulum. And it's called rough because it has ribosomes. Its structure is folded membrane covered with ribosomes. Its function is protein synthesis and processing of proteins. When I think of rough endoplasmic reticulum, I think of that phrase, protein synthesis. That's where lots of proteins are made. Now, you probably notice I did something here, maybe because I was lazy or whatever, where I just sort of extended this line here down beyond where there are ribosomes and I made this folded up membrane here and you know what different species have different shapes of organelles for what it's worth there's variation in organelles so uh -huh. some species they have smooth endoplasmic reticulum that looks just like rough endoplasmic reticulum except it doesn't have ribosomes this Organelle number four is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, again, there are other organisms that have slightly different forms of it, meaning they have, they're more tubular. They're, they're more um, filamentous or something like that. And they, um, but they are still the same thing, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a large surface area that's used to coordinate the production of molecules. Now, what molecules? Well, just think about this for a minute. Most nucleotides and stuff like that are kind of, are formed in the nucleus. Uh, where are proteins formed? Rough endoplasmic reticulum. So what's left? We've got carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleotides, the N, P. So for what it's worth, it's general thought, and there's good evidence to support this, that the Carbohydrate and lipid synthesis inside of cells happens on smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The kind of endoplasmic reticulum that does not have a ribosome. Ribosomes are protein manufacturing machines. Um, no, this is an area of membrane, which is represents surface area for the production of carbohydrates and lipids. You know, um, some cells are so densely packed with uh, endoplasmic reticulum that, that you just think this is a huge manufacturing cell. It is involved in the manufacture and probably the export business too. It probably makes and exports molecules. Now, once these molecules have been manufactured over here or here, sometimes they can become available for use immediately, but often, most of the time, I think, they instead have to be transported from the rough endoplasmic reticulum or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum over to this organelle down here that is called a Golgi complex organelle number five. And um, if you read about, I'm gonna show you pictures of Golgi complexes for sure. But if you read about Golgi complexes, you'll see that they are described as a stack of flat Sacks. So here's sac one, sac two, sac three, sac four, sac five, sacs. It's like a stack of flattened sacs. And then at the edges of these sacs, there is constantly forming these little membrane bubbles called Golgi 
vesicles. Now, I have to tell you that, that this whole thing here, the Golgi complex, the Golgi apparatus, the Golgi body, the Golgi vesicles, these are all named after an Italian histologist named Camillus Golgi. So we always have to capitalize this. Golgi is his last name, and so it's, it is supposed to be capitalized. All right, now this Golgi complex, this is where molecules from the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they are moved into the Golgi complex, they are processed here in these bags, and then they are packaged, in many cases, into little vesicles, and those vesicles then leave the Golgi complex and move around the cell. All right, so let's see what that looks like. Um, I have got some cool pictures of Golgi complexes. These are mostly electron micrographs, though there is one sort of artist's conceptualization. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're trying to look at is the actual structure of a Golgi complex. So take a look. Here's one. Pretty good one. Um, so take a look. This is the nucleus. This right here is chromatin. This is a nucleolus. This is a nuclear membrane. You can clearly see the double layers of it. And there's a nuclear pore and a nuclear pore and a nuclear pore. And so now we're outside the nucleus. This thing is a Golgi complex. Now look, one, two, three, four, five, five-ish stacks of five in a stack of these little flat sacks. I mean, I don't know how many times I've read in a biology book that somebody comparing a Golgi complex to a stack of pancakes, you know, like you cross, do a cross section through a stack of pancakes. But each of these sacks is a place where stuff can be processed. But then what happens is at the end of these sacks, do you see this? The end of the sack can pinch off and form a little membrane bubble like this. And that little membrane bubble is called a Golgi vesicle. And so let me write that down because that's just, uh, I think, important. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Okay. Oops, I never entered that in. Sorry. Oh, a Golgi vesicle, um, a vesicle is a, I don't know how else to do it, how to say it, it's like a bubble. type of molecule enclosed oh a vesicle is a bubble made of membrane with some type of molecule enclosed inside of it so i mean really when we look at vesicles we're looking at um structures like well i've drawn them right there but if i went Where am I going here? There I go. Take a look at this right here. This is a lysosome. This black outer line represents the membrane. Here's outside the vesicle. 
here's inside the vesicle. In this case, since it's a lysosome, it's a vesicle containing powerful digestive enzymes. So what's in here, right, whoops, what's in here, this stuff inside the vesicle, that's digestive enzymes. But then this, oh my gosh. This line where this arrow is pointing, this is the outer membrane of the vesicle known as a lysosome. We're looking at the Golgi complex now. Sacks of flattened membrane sacks with attached and free Golgi vesicles. Membrane, uh, Golgi vesicles are a membrane vesicle. Their job is to transport Golgi products. I don't even know why I try to draw an arrow with this. Anyway, back down here. So the Golgi complex, now I know, I'm getting distracted here. Um, there we go. Look, let's look at another Golgi vesicle, Golgi complex. I guess it must have been lost. So. Ooh, look at this one. This one is cool. You know, I collected all of this on Google pretty fast. It's a little too big for the resolution, but it looks to me like I see like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, uh, twenty stacks. Look, these are the flat sacks I was talking about. Now, notice at the end of these sacks, they are pinching off to form Golgi vesicles, which will transport substances away from the Golgi complex. So that's kind of a cool one. Um, I don't know, I've got a lot. I've got several, I don't know, we need to look at them all. Come on. There's, look at this picture, there's one, two, three Golgi complexes all in the very similar area of the cell. Wow, look at this one. Look at how many stacks of flat sacks this one has. And, and really, you can really see how at the end, these are pinching off to form a membrane bubble that is a Golgi vesicle. Now, I don't know, I got to show you this picture, it's funny. This is actually a card that somebody made called Happy Golgi Complex Day. Now, honestly, I don't think. It's dangerous to put me in front of a computer at the same time as I'm teaching because um, it looks to me as if there's actually no Golgi complex day. I thought there might be, but uh, there isn't. I mean, I just thought, I think that this was a joke. Somebody made up this, uh, this card for a reason. But take a look at it. This is supposed to be the interior of a cell. So first, you see this round thing here? It looks like it's round. It looks like it has these large permanent pores in it. Uh I'm pretty darn sure that's the nucleus. Now, um, around the nucleus here, I see this stuff, which I would have done this differently, but I honestly think this is rough endoplasmic reticulum right here. And this sort of filamentous or tubular stuff over here is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And this is a mitochondrion, right? So we've got that's the powerhouse of the cell, right? Now, this must be the Golgi complex. This thing that looks like a stack of empanadas. One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven empanadas all stacked up with these bubbles around it. Those are Golgi vesicles. This is their representation of the Golgi complex. And um, anyway, I think um, that 
this isn't a bad representation. I, I probably would have done things a little bit differently, but I don't think there is a Golgi complex day. I, I, I don't know how many times I've talked about this image and I never had a computer right in front of me where I could Google Golgi complex day. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a Golgi complex day. But anyway, so we, we were able to look at some uh, pretty, I think, some pretty good images of Golgi complexes. And these are real microphotographs. Um, as opposed to my silly drawing, okay? But my silly drawing is okay. See, it's a bunch of flattened sacks, and it has Golgi vesicles. I think I probably should have rotated it so it had one surface facing the nucleus maybe or something like that. Organelle number five, Golgi complex, Golgi vesicles. Now, here's the thing. Golgi vesicles, it, it seems as if there's two possible things that can happen with the Golgi vesicle, right? Two possible things. One is that the Golgi vesicle can actually stay inside the cell and do some important job inside the cell. Like some Golgi vesicles will mature into other organelles like a, um, a lysosome or peroxisome, right? But some Golgi vesicles have a completely different fate. Their fate is what I like to refer to as the extracellular fate of a Golgi vesicle, which means that that Golgi vesicle is actually going to be grabbed by a movement protein, and it is going to be slowly marched over to the edge of a cell. And when it hits the edge of the cell, it's going to be pushed against the edge and it's going to um, release whatever contents it had outside the cell. This process, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't, I can't rotate this to do it, but this process is called secretion. And I honestly think it's one of the more interesting processes that cells do. It's called secretion. And it is the manufacture and export of a valuable cell product. Like saliva like sweat, like skin oils, like mucus, hormones, digestive enzymes. Well, these are some famous secretions, things that are actually manufactured. So everybody got those notes. I can pop them down. I am going to see if I can figure out where I was. I was right here. And so that's what's happening over here, way down in the lower right-hand corner. This vesicle is going to be carefully and purposely moved over to the edge of the cell. It's going to fuse with the cell membrane. And when it does, it's going to release its contents into the extracellular environment. It's actually releasing its contents from the cell. So um, that secretion process is one I'd like to talk a little bit more about, okay? Now, I'm sorry to be confusing with this next document, but um, remember what I said a minute ago here. I said that there were two possible fates of a Golgi vesicle. One of those fates is the fates that I'm going to call the intracellular fate. Remember, intracellular meant inside the cell. So it's going to involve being inside the cell. And what that means is it's going to mature into an organelle, like a lysosome. The extracellular fate means that, that Golgi vesicle 
going to be transported over to the edge of the cell, and whatever was inside of it is actually going to be spit out by the cell deliberately. And that the deliberateness of that is an important part of the idea of, of secretion, right? That it's something the cell is doing. It's a cell job. So there's two possible fates. There's actually a column below the intracellular and a column below the extracellular, right? So let's ignore this for now. <laughs> In a real class, I would cover that side. We're only going to look at this, the extracellular side, for a minute. Don't worry. We're going to come back to this side for sure. Okay. Um, so anyway, on the right side here, we're talking about the extracellular fate of a Golgi vesicle. And in the extracellular fate is the Golgi vesicle will form what's called a secretory vesicle used for secretion. Secretion is the manufacture and release of a valuable cell product. The things that are released are called secretions. Um, the process that we use to do it is called secretion. Um, the, ver the terminology here can be a little bit confusing, but uh, we just have to stick with it, right? So in the extracellular fate, the Golgi vesicle will form what's called a secretory vesicle used for secretion. Secretion is the manufacture and release of a valuable cell product, and those things are called secretions. Um, the bottom line here is that there's kind of a, a noun form and a verb form of this word. The verb form is the process of secretion, the manufacture and release of a valuable cell product. And the noun form is the name of a secretion like saliva or sweat or tears or oil gland or hormones or digestive enzymes. Right? Um, all kinds of different possible secretions, right? So... Most people aren't that familiar with the whole secretion idea. Um, I, I want to say that there's a large number of cells in our body that do secretion all the time. And then there are cells that probably don't do secretion much at all. Um, secretion, you know, kind of means that the cell is in the manufacture and export business. And at least part of its energy is devoted to manufacture and export. Um, and it's usually manufacturing and exporting something. Well, let's say I think it's manufacturing and exporting something always for the benefit of other cells, right? It does something important. So, so here are some famous secretions. For example, saliva is a famous secretion. It is secreted by the salivary glands. And... Um, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's secreted by the, these special glands called the salivary glands. And these are glands that are embedded in the sides of our face adjacent to our mouth. Now, maybe you've never thought about saliva. You probably haven't thought too much about it. But let me tell you, when you look at saliva, you realize it is just packed full of molecules. One of the most famous molecules that is produced as part of saliva is good old mucus, M-U-C-U-S, mucus. Pretty sure that's how it's spelled, mucus. And I got to tell you right away, mucus is always a protective secretion. That's what it is. Mucus is always a protective secretion. Usually when mucus is manufactured, it is designed to protect cells. Now, I would say that, that mucus doesn't have a particularly, it's kind of an infamous molecule, right? But that mucus is actually uh, the mucus that's being produced in my body, like right now in my nose because my allergies, et cetera, that mucus, its purpose is to capture particles and carry them out of my nasal cavity. That's what its purpose is. Right? It's not making mucus just for fun. It's making this sticky flypaper stuff. And the reason is pretty straightforward. It is because <clears throat> it helps protect my sinus cavities. Okay, wrong PowerPoint, right PowerPoint. Okay. So 
one of the things that's secreted in saliva is water and a protein called mucin. This is manufactured in the cell. And when you mix water and mucin together, you get good old slimy mucus. Now, what does this mucus do in the, in the case of your mouth? It protects your throat, meaning that when you choose food, you chew food, you're automatically mixing mucus in with the food and you're automatically making mucus to lubricate and soften the food so that when you swallow it, it it's less dramatic. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you simply uh, were chewing on something and for some reason your mouth was as dry as a bone and you were finding that it was hurting your mouth and having, or having trouble swallowing. Well, that's what the water and mucin are mixed together to form mucus are supposed to be doing for you, helping you uh, swallow things without damaging the delicate tissues of your throat. There's an enzyme in saliva that you've heard of before called salivary amylase. Amylase is, of course, the enzyme that will break down amylose into glucose is right in your mouth. Um, there's a, an enzyme, it's called a lysozyme. And lice means to split or cut. Lysozymes are enzymes that um, are designed to kill and cripple uh, and cut up bacteria. So in our saliva, there's actually an antibiotic that helps to kill bacteria. And then lastly on this list, and who knows, this list may be longer than this. Lastly, there is a hormone called an endothelin, endothelin. And the an endothelin hormone is a hormone that stimulates the growth of um, epithelial lining cells. So you are maybe scraping a whole bunch of cells off your mouth when you you may be scraping a, a bunch of cells off your mouth <clears throat> when you eat anything. But it's interesting that in saliva, there's a hormone that's designed to stimulate you to make new cells to replace the ones that you lost. So again, here, here's inside of a salivary gland, there are a number of different cells, all of which whose job it is, all of which participate in the production of saliva by making different salivary secretions that get mixed together in the saliva and get secreted by your salivary glands, okay? Now, what other glands do secretions? Well, sweat glands make a secretion called sweat. Tear glands make a secretion called tears. Oil glands in your skin make secretions called oils, mostly triglycerides. Hormones are famous secretions. Um, you know, in, in, in <clears throat> they are produced by individual cells, okay? Digestive enzymes, you know, meaning whatever you, you're using to digest your, um, whatever you're eating. Those digestive enzymes are manufactured by cells that line the um, intestine or the stomach wall, uh, the stomach wall or the small intestine. And they are released in order that they can um, have contact with um, the food that you're eating. So all these different kinds of glands you know, I want to point out this important point right here. These two words are similar. The words are secretion and excretion. And they do not mean the same thing in a biological sense. Excretion is the release of a waste product from a cell. The cell figures out if something's a waste product, it needs to get rid of it. It could be damaged cell parts, it could be um, something you know left over from rearranging a cell or whatever, but it may uh, but it may be you know the results of metabolism. But when a cell does excretion, it is releasing a waste product from a cell. And that could be something, you know, it could be something that's, it's usually gonna be something that's not valuable. It's probably toxic. Things like carbon dioxide or urea, which is kind of the way your body gets rid of carbon dioxide by shuffling it into your, um, yeah, by 
creating that's one of the ways you get rid of uh, amino acids by creating urea and putting those in urine. But remember, excretion is the release of a waste product. Secretion is something completely different. Secretion, like it says up here, is the manufacture and release of a valuable cell product. And I think most of us would agree that, um, <clears throat> that waste products are not valuable cell products. Okay. Uh, get rid of all of that stuff. Anyway, so secretions. Any questions about secretions? Because I'm not quite done talking about secretions, but I'm happy to answer a question. Does anybody have a question about secretions? Here's your chance to ask me a question about secretions. I'm like an expert on secretions. One of the few things that I have any expertise in at all, but believe me, I'm good at secreting. So there's another form of the world. Secretory vesicle. Secretion is the manufacture and export. Secretion is what is exported. Secreting is what you do when you are making secretions. All right, well, where I'm going to go next is I'm going to go down here. And I have to tell you, yeah. I don't know why that types of RNA, I, I need to rearrange that types of RNA slide a little bit. Let's tweak it. Uh oh, okay. Someone's home from school. Um, uh, what was I thinking of doing here? It was something I was thinking of doing, and I completely lost track of it. Ah, okay. Sorry, folks. I am losing my mind here today. All right, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go back here. Uh, here. There's where I wanted to go with this. I want to continue down. There, there's one more continuation down here. This particular slide is called cell organelle structure and function dot two. Uh, the first one was this one. Okay. Here's the second one. Here's a slide that's completely out of place. And here's the next page in line, uh, all related to that right hand column. Okay. So this one is called cell organelle structure and function dot three. And it talks about glands. Now look, we're talking about the salivary gland hormone producing glands, et cetera. So let's just spend a minute talking about what a gland is. And, um, and of course, it, how it relates to the um, process of secretion. <laughs> and the valuable role that some cells play in secretion. It turns out there's basically two types of glands. A gland is an organ that contains secretory cells and produces secretions. So a gland is the is the bigger structure, probably macroscopically visible, that is made up of cells that do secretion and some other parts, probably. So a gland is an organ that contains secretory cells and produces secretions. First one I'd like to talk about is the kind that's called an exocrine gland. An exocrine means uh, to, it basically means to secrete outside is what, yeah, I think is what it means. Exocrine glands actually have a duct or tube that delivers what they make to a specific part. So here's the body of the gland. The body, we're just using a generic gland here, right? Because um, we, the, the actual exam one, I think, well, sorry, here we go. Bottom line is, is that this tube called a duct is how you can tell it's an exocrine gland. It is a ducted gland. It is a tube gland. The body here has probably an outer capsule that protects it, but inside it is full of manufacturing cells. These cells inside this gland, these are all manufacturing 
cells that make secretions. And when they make their secretions, they empty them here into the body of the gland, and then they slowly but surely get moved into the duct. And then you kind of hope that smoothly and surely they will be emptied where they're supposed to go. So this is a, a great model for like a salivary gland, right? Where you've got, um, you have, <clears throat> the cells that make saliva here, they could be making uh, water, they could be making mucus, they could be making um, uh, lysozyme, they could be making um, uh, salivary amylase, they could be making, what else was in there, endothelin, all these different cells making different stuff. And they just dump it into the body of the gland, and then the gland has a smooth muscle tract here whose job it is to move the stuff from in the body of the gland to outside the body of the gland. So exocrine glands always have a tube. And that includes glands like the sweat glands, the salivary glands, mucus glands, oil glands, digestive enzyme glands, gastro, including the gastric glands in the stomach, uh, the pancreatic uh, glands in the small intestine that empty substances into the small intestine. These are all exocrine glands. Now, the other kind of gland is this one called an endocrine or ductus gland. Now, remember, exocrine meant it had a distinctive duct. You know, like the pancreas, this is a really interesting gland because it's both, it's both an exocrine and an endocrine gland. There are parts of the pancreas that make pancreatic digestive enzymes and pancreatic buffers, and they dump those into a duct. The duct is called the pancreatic duct, surprise, and it connects with the very first inches of um, the small intestine. So it dumps its secretions into the very beginning of the small intestine. But I have to tell you, at the same time, as you already know, in the pancreas, there are exocrine cells, like um, cells that make pancreatic digestive enzymes, but there are also endocrine cells, like alpha cells and beta cells, that make hormones like insulin and glucagon. So the pancreas is a gland that has both exocrine and endocrine parts. Now, if you're an endocrine gland, the endocrine means you secrete inside yourself you're ductless. You don't have a built-in tube like this to take it where you want things to go. No. What happens instead is you, this gland, an endocrine gland, it is packed with blood vessels and the, the cells make the endocrine substance and they drop it outside themselves. And then the blood that's coming by picks it up and takes it away. And look, this blood is constantly flowing, never changing, constantly flowing. This blood will pick up a hormone and it will transport it to the entire body. Certainly, it will transport it into target cells. Target cells are the cells in the body that that hormone is aimed at. You know, so for example, um, at puberty, the pituitary gland, that's the base of the brain, it makes some sex-related hormones like luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, and it empties those into the bloodstream, and those hormones go everywhere, but most cells in the body don't even see them because they're not the target cells. What they see, what, what cells do see it, are cells in the ovaries or testes. Those cells are designed to see um, this particular hormone. And um, so they stimulate the production of sex hormones like estrogen or testosterone. They stimulate the production of sex cells like um, eggs or sperm, but they come from the pituitary gland at the base of the brain into the bloodstream. They circulate around and they, um, and they only affect certain cells in the body. So when we talk about endocrine glands, it's good to remember that all the secretions of endocrine glands are called hormones. Hormones are the secretions manufactured by endocrine glands. And that includes glands like the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the sex glands, the pituitary glands, the pancreas, 
and other ones that I'm not thinking about. So endocrine gland, exocrine gland, these are appropriate to talk about now because they are, um, they are related to the process of secretion by individual cells. Okay, so I'm gonna go back up this column. This column right here is designed to connect directly to this stuff right here, okay? And that's what I was trying to do a minute ago is, is I was trying to figure out how to Just move this around a little bit. What did I do here? Oh, there we go. So this one would have been much better here, I think, than there. Because this shows a column, it goes all the way down. It extends down into, yeah, it extends down into this one, right? Okay, so uh, can I ask, are there any questions on this particular side of the slide here that talks about secretion? We're, we'll talk about this next when we come back from our break. This is all about secretions and famous secretions. Right? Secretion and famous secretions. All right, so coming back. This is my cat, Kensu. Um, his, Kensu is Egyptian, it means the son of Bastet. All male cats are also known as Kensu, but, um, but we call him Little Boy. And he was a really stupid cat black cat who insisted on laying out in the street at night, right? Laying out in the street at night, black cat. And after I almost run him over about three or four times, he was just a little kitten. I said, forget it. If I don't rescue him, he's going to be dead soon. Okay. Um, okay. I guess I'll leave this up so you can ponder it, but I need to take a break. I have got to get up. One of my legs is like numb. All right, it's been about an hour-ish. So let's take another break now, another 10-minute break. I need to get some more caffeine, and uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes, okay?
just to stream the music you hear, not to decide what you hear. Radio made by music lovers for music lovers.
All right, I'm back. I can actually sort of feel my leg now. That's a good thing. I don't know about anybody else, but I mean, I, I'm absolutely, you could, I suppose, move around, stretch and all that. I don't have that option, really. I'm kind of stuck in this little chair. And uh, after a while, it. You know, I'm beginning to think I might need to get like an expensive ergonomic chair if I'm going to continue to, to, to if I'm continue to teach virtually like this. Anyway, so this side of this page was all about secretion. And, um, and remember, it was related to this fate of a Golgi vesicle, the extracellular fate of a Golgi vesicle. So what I would like to talk about next is the intracellular fate of a Golgi vesicle. That's what's going on when a vesicle stays inside the cell. And when a vesicle stays inside the cell, now we're talking about this column, the intracellular fate of a Golgi vesicle. And the Golgi vesicle will stay inside the cell and mature into an organelle. And when I say mature, it can really change dramatically. It can get much bigger. It can, it, it, it will, it, once that vesicle's created, it can, uh, it can, um, it, it can increase in size. It can put. It can build more pumps to put in uh, the edge of the membrane. It can be chemically. It can change chemically. All kinds of amazing things can happen. So one of the organelles that is formed this way is organelle number six, called a lysosome. And lice, you might remember, I used lice when I was talking about a kind of reaction called hydrolysis. And I said lice means to um, split or cut. And a lysosome is an organelle. And by the way, some is, is really a, a word, a Latin word body that refers to organelles, right? It refers to organelles. And so a lysosome is a splitting or cutting body. And if you go, and here's what it looks like. It's a, it's a membrane bubble with, digestive enzymes in it. The ve it is a vesicle containing powerful digestive enzymes. And here's one of my favorite phrases for it, intracellular digestion, because this is the organelle that, as it says, does intracellular digestion of nutrients, intracellular remodeling, destruction of pathogens, or <clears throat> damaged organelles. When I think of a lysosome, one of the stories that comes to mind for me is the story that occurs when a white blood cell eats a bacterium and needs to kill it and digest it. And it will certainly use lysosomes to do that because they will not only produce enzymes that will kill a bacterium, but they will produce, um, they will produce enzymes that will kill a bacterium, but they will also um, digest the bacterium in case there's any useful nutrients. Um, so, Lysosome is a vesicle that creates and carries digestive enzymes. These enzymes, you might remember this name, they're called hydrolases um, because they're responsible for intracellular digestion. And again, there, there are conditions in which um, the cell needs to break down nutrients and lysosomes can be involved in that. The cell can be involved in cellular remodeling and, and so sometimes when cells are damaged, lysosomes will step in and their goal will be to um, help remodel and repair the cell. Uh, I remember reading an article many, many years ago, I wish I had a copy of it now, that talked about how tadpoles will use lysosomes uh, in the cells of their tail to digest their own tail. Because a tadpole, when it turns from a sort of fishy looking thing, into a frog, it doesn't just drop its tail off like a lizard does. No, it actually reabsorbs its tail and it uses lysosomes to do that, to help it do that. And it digests the cells in its tail and it recycles the structures and elements uh, to um, use to build uh, legs in the little baby frog. So lysosome um, is a cell of intracellular digestion. The other one is a peroxisome, and I'm, I'm going to 
show you some uh, electron micrographs in a few minutes that compare peroxisomes and lysosomes for sure. A peroxisome is a vesicle that creates and carries enzymes for detoxification. Um, here's the thing. There is a type of poison that's produced in cells that are called peroxides. Peroxides are metabolic toxins that are related to oxygen. So if you do oxygen, meta oxygen metabolism or you break down molecules that have oxygen, sometimes you will create what are called peroxides. And peroxides are pretty dangerous toxins that need to be broken down. Um, so the, among other things, peroxisomes have enzymes in them to break down peroxides and break them down into oxygen and water. So certainly into molecules that are much less dangerous than peroxides. Now, look, I, when I think about peroxides, I have to tell you that I always think about my mom when I'm thinking about peroxides. And the reason is simple. When I was a kid, my mom, if I came home with a scratch or a scrape or whatever, my mom would immediately want to sit me down and pour hydrogen peroxide on my wound. My mom considered hydrogen peroxide to be a wound cleaner. And it is. It is a wound cleaner. I'm not going to dispute my mom by any means, but it is a wound cleaner. And you probably have some hydrogen peroxide in your home. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Hydrogen peroxide is an example of, of a toxic peroxide, right? Um, even though hydrogen peroxide is heavily diluted when you buy it, um, it still says right on it, do not drink it. They can be a skull and crossbones on it because it's still dang potentially dangerous stuff. Now, um, when you buy hydrogen peroxide, you've probably noticed that hydrogen peroxide is always sold in a brown bottle, always. And that's because hydrogen peroxide is sensitive to light. And, and that is a light tight bottle designed to prevent the hydrogen peroxide from um, decomposing because it's not that stable of a molecule. Here's its formula, H2O2. And um, like I said, this is a poisonous molecule. You don't want it in your cells and you certainly don't want to drink it. Um, it's heavily diluted. I think it's 3% hydrogen peroxide, and that's what my mom would pour on my wound. Well, when hydrogen peroxide breaks down, here's the chemical equation, it breaks down into water, safe, and oxygen, safe, right? Um, but when it first comes in, it's actually a minor poison, even though it's heavily diluted. If it's broken down, it can be broken down into water and oxygen, which it certainly does. And um, the question is, does it break down really slowly? Because hydrogen peroxide is kind of unstable. Will it break down really slowly? Or do you want it to break down really fast? Well, in cells, there is an enzyme called catalase and catalase is actually a type of enzyme called uh, peroxidase. Peroxidases, as you might guess, there's the ASE for enzyme, and there's the peroxid for peroxides. This is an enzyme that breaks down peroxides. And the most famous example of it is, forget it, catalase. Now, if you expose hydrogen peroxide to catalase, it's going to going to break apart 10,000 times faster. And that means lots of bubbing, bubbling and fizzing because of the oxygen. So what's going on when I, um, when I, my mom puts this on a wound? Well, remember, if you have a wound that has killed and damaged cells, which wounds will, those cells rupture open when they rupture open, they release, um, among other things, peroxisomes. And those peroxisomes have a little thin membrane, and inside that membrane, they have catalase.
And that catalase will start to tear that hydrogen peroxide apart, turn it into water and oxygen, or to yeah, it will break it apart to release water and oxygen. And the water will help clean the wound out. And the oxygen will bubble and fizz and also help clean the wound out. I mean, parenthetically, it's also true that there are some nasty kinds of bacteria that are poisoned by oxygen, but I doubt that that's a common, really common use of this, right? Mostly, it's a matter of you come home with a big knee that's all scraped and bloody, and you don't want to touch it, so you put hydrogen peroxide on it. It is a poison, but the second it touches the wound, it gets exposed to these enzymes, and it breaks down into water and oxygen. It's percolated kind of down into the wound, and now it's bubbling and fizzing and lifting stuff out. It could lift out dirt. It could lift out bacteria. It could lift out mold spores. It could lift out uh, viruses. It could lift out all kinds of stuff. And then you can sort of flush that stuff away um, because you have a molecule that when you first drop it in, it, it might burn a little bit, but it immediately breaks down into water and oxygen, okay? And, um, and that's why my mom would use it. And, and it's great because it reminds me, of course, of the organella peroxisome, the enzymes, catalase or peroxidase, and the hydrogen peroxide and how it's broken down and why it is useful as a wound cleaner. Now, I will also tell you that, among other things, peroxisomes are also important in detoxifying alcohol. So you find a lot of peroxisomes in different tissues, a lot of peroxisomes in liver cells. So back up to here, we were talking about lysosomes and peroxisomes. And these are a couple of other um, membranous organelles. And, you know, I apologize, I didn't mention this before. But maybe you notice that right here, at the top of the, a list here, it says this phrase, membranous organelles, which means the organelles that are mostly made of membrane. And membranous organelles are go all the way down here to mitochondria. So the nucleus, nucleolus, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, lysosomes, peroxisomes, mitochondria, these are all membranous organelles. But then there's a set of non-membranous organelles, and that means that they're not, they're mostly not made of membrane. We've already talked about one of those lysosomes, right? Check it off. We need to talk about cytoskeleton, centrioles, and some of these other things for sure. But, but I think I've just managed to cover all of the membranous organelles, and that's, well, that's progress, huh? No? Um, Let's jump out for a second because I can't resist the urge to um, look over here at organelles. And uh, let's see, there's, here we go. So here's an electron micrograph. And um, we can see numerous organelles in it, but one of the reasons I'm showing it to you is to show you a lysosome and a peroxisome and show you that they look very, very similar. <laughs> Hard to tell them apart. I'm pretty sure these are mitochondria just because of their shape. But the only really way to tell the difference between a lysosome and a peroxisome is to know what's inside of it. Because if what's inside of it is digestive enzymes, hydrolases, then it's a lysosome. If what's inside of it are peroxidases, like catalase, then it is a peroxisome. But I got to show you, remember I mentioned earlier that, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, <clears throat> there was, they these organelles mature. Well, I got to show you an image that when I first saw it, I mean, it just blew my mind. Let's see if I can find it here. Well, that's not necessarily a bad one, but there was another one I really liked. Here we go. Look at this one. This is a cool image. And I'll, I'll tell you why it blew my mind when I saw it, okay? Because 
you can probably recognize these. You recognize them from ones we've looked at already. These are Golgi complexes. Now, look, they do. You call them Golgi apparatus. They call them Golgi bodies. But I believe the most the most accurate term for them is Golgi complex. And so here's the flattened sacs. Now, remember, at the ends of these sacs, they pinch off and they form Golgi vesicles. And some Golgi vesicles, as you know, are faded to carry secretory products over to the edge of the cell and spit them out. But some of them are faded to become organelles. They will mature into an organelle, okay? So what's one of the organelles they mature into? A lysosome. But wait a minute. Look at how huge this lysosome is. It's, it's as big as the entire Golgi complex. This is where it started out, and then it got bigger, and then it got bigger, and then it got bigger, and now it's huge. This is all part of this um, maturation process. The, the um, lysosome receives pumps that can pump hydrogen ions into it, so it, that will enlarge it. It has the ability to continually manufacture per, um, perox, excuse me, it, um, to per, continually manufacture digestive enzymes, and it gets bigger and bigger to the point where it's, li it's literally bigger than the entire organelle that formed it originally, because here's what it looked like originally when it was first pinched off, and look at it now. It is a mature, useful lysosome, and um, that just, when I, you know, again, uh, I'm easily entertained. I saw that picture and I thought, oh my gosh, what is the story here? Take a look at this one's a similar kind of thing. I mean, here's Golgi complexes right here and here. And here's a peroxisome formed from a Golgi complex. And it is much, much bigger. It originally started off as a little Golgi vesicle like this. And now look at it. It's all mature into a big old peroxisome. Okay. So the next organelles that I'd like to talk about, and I'm going to keep my eye on the clock because I would like to talk about this lab and um, all that kind of stuff. But the next, um, whoops, let me go back. The next organelles that I'd like to talk about are organelles in the non-membranous organelle group. Now, we've already talked about ribosomes quite a bit. Uh, when you see ribosomes, they literally look like little black dots. Now, I know this is going to be a pain to, to collect, but next week uh, when I give you this exam, one of the essay questions is going to ask you to draw a typical animal cell and to draw organelles inside the cell accurately and to label the organelles so that I know what you've drawn and to explain the function of each organelle. So there'll be maybe 10 organelles or structures within a cell. And I'm going to ask you to do something I think basic bio students should do, be able to do, which is draw a very basic animal cell with all the organelles inside of it that um, I ask you to draw. And I will be expecting you to draw reasonably accurate images and label them completely accurately and describe what they do in a cell uh, completely accurately, okay? So there's an essay on the next exam. I mean, if you want to start going back and looking at some cells, like, I don't know, here's a cell I provided way back when. Uh, that that uh, you could certainly use as a template you know what I need to do, and I haven't put it in here, but I will put it in here, okay? I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll go all the way. Yeah, I hope that didn't give anybody a headache here. I'm going to go all the way to the end. I'm going to put a new slide there. Oh, that was a bad choice of slides to put there, I see. My mistake. Maybe I'll go here. No, maybe I'll go here. 
Yeah, this might work. All right. Now, I don't want anybody to laugh. You know, you could certainly, I, your microphone is muted, so I don't guess I would know if you laughed or not. But I want to show you a document. Here it is. All right, so it's in um, here, okay. Sorry, taking up our valuable class time. But I want to show you a picture that might help you when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to answering that particular essay. Okay, here it is. Uh, and again, no laughing, please. Hey, believe me, I'm not going to try and draw this using the draw function for any circumstances. But here it is. Here's my drawing of a typical eukaryotic cell. Pretty accurate, really. And it's, you know, of course, the cell membrane. And it's got the cytoplasm, the cytosol. It's got the nucleus, nuclear membrane, nuclear pore, chromatin, nucleolus. It's got rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, Golgi vesicle, mitochondria, mitochondria, oh, peroxisome. Uh, lysosome, it's got it all. Well, anyway, I'm going to post this, um, you know, I retweaked this document, so I'm going to repost it again, and uh, you'll have access to that if you'd like, okay? Uh, where was I? Oops, I was getting ahead of myself here. Because what I was wanting to talk about down here was some of the non-membranous organelles. All of these organelles here are mostly made of cytoskeleton. And cytoskeleton is amazing stuff. It is the um, it is a set of protein rods and tubes that um, are um, that are super important in moving stuff around the cell. And okay, here I am. I'm going to go in here, insert a graphic that I meant to insert. Perfect. All right, I want you to see this cytoskeleton summary here. Oh, that's assuming I can grab it, we'll see. Yeah, it looks like I took this picture with my cell phone, but it'll still work, okay? And we need to come back to it in a minute. Where did I put it? Where should it go? Here? Sure, why not? This is as good a place as I need to put it. Uh, but I'm going to go back right to here, okay? And I'm going to start the slideshow right there. So... Down here in the group of organelles here that are called the non-membranous organelles, we've already talked about ribosomes. Cytoskeleton is what makes up 
the rest of these organelles. And what is cytoskeleton? Well, it says here, proteins organized in thin filaments or tubules. But look, let me just show you the document that I just included in here. And it says, the cytoskeleton is a set of protein rods and tubules that supports the cell and provides an internal framework for attachment and transportation. Its molecular structure, it's proteins. Proteins like actin, myosin, tubulin. The functions of the cytoskeleton are many. Like one thing the cytoskeleton does is the same thing our normal skeleton does. It supports and gives the body our framework, right? It can be used to attach organelles. It can be used to do whole cell movements, the entire cell moving around, like swimming or gliding or sliding. It can also be used for organelle movements. Like, for example, when you move a Golgi vesicle um, from the Golgi complex over to the edge of the cell, it's going to be moved along a highway made of cytoskeleton. So let me just show you um, real quickly. I have got some kind of cool pictures of cytoskeleton. And uh, I don't know, th th this is a pretty cool image. Which hopefully I can enlarge. No, why wouldn't it let me enlarge this image? I don't get that. All right. Well, here's a pretty good image too. I don't even need to enlarge it. Here's a cell, here's the cell membrane. Here's the nucleus here. Look at all of this stuff here. This is all cytoskeleton all cytoskeleton now honestly i doubt that they have actually stained all the cytoskeleton here i think they've probably only stained one maybe two types of cytoskeleton but look at this image and see just how packed this image is with cytoskeleton i mean it is just packed 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 and so when we start to think about cytoskeleton, here is a great image to imagine what it looks like inside of a cell. Again, lots of cytoskeleton here. I've always liked this image a lot. I just don't get why I can't enlarge it. Um, over here, more cytoskeleton inside of cells in this case, actually seeing this is pretty interesting is these blue things that are labeled here are chromosomes and these fibers of cytoskeleton are attached to every chromosome and the structure that forms this it's right here and it's right here this is a non-membranous organelle I think it's organelle number 11 it's called a centriole and a centriole is a cluster of cytoskeleton microtubules that is designed to um, create a basket of cytoskeleton that's used to move chromosomes around during cell division. So it's only found in animal cells. You don't find it in plant cells. Now, plant cells do lots of cell division. We'll talk about cell division, but lots of cell division, but they just don't seem to have centrioles. So who knows what the story is with that, right? Um, bottom line is that, um, that there's another way we can see cytoskeleton expressed. This next image um, is of an amoeba that is kind of crawling, and this is the cytoskeleton inside of it. So um, I doubt this is going to work, but I'm going to try it anyway. Yeah, I didn't didn't really think it would work, huh?
Oh, can I find it? Let's see. Yay! Well, I'll tell you, I know I should have these all put together perfectly uh, before class. Oh, and that is my ultimate goal. Uh, but I, I probably will never uh, really achieve that. But take a look at that. This slide, I just stuck it in between here, here here okay so we've got a beautiful picture of cytoskeleton right here that is designed to accompany this right here okay now lots of cytoskeletal stuff one more document that i want to put in here for you is i'm um, going to put the same new slide there's a document i really want to share with you and this document is called Actually, you know what? Sorry, I apologize. I actually think this, I already created this slide. There it is right there. So this slide I want to jump it all the way up here too. Uh, by the way, there are pieces of this PowerPoint that I am going to leave to you to work with. Uh, I'm not going to actually cover them today because I've kind of already covered them and they're just so that you can watch the rest of this slideshow and review it okay well I guess I lost it somewhere because this isn't what I wanted to drag over here this is what I wanted to drag over here Because, um, th let's just go back to various functions of cytoskeleton. Look at that beautiful picture of cytoskeleton. Thank you, whoever took that picture. I really appreciate it. Uh, and then this should be... Uh, What? What? There we go. Now, what this slide is about, let me uh, go back here, go to slideshow, current slide, there we are. But look at this document that I put together for you. These are all organelles that are called the cell membrane extension organelles. And that's written here too. This is, of course, an overhead transparency that I somehow managed to convert into um, a document and embed in here. <laughs> it's a dinosaur alert, okay? Now, these cell membrane extension organelles are in the group of organelles. These are organelles 12, 13, and 14. And these are all organelles that um, are related to cytoskeleton because it does make any difference if you're microvilli or cilia or flagelli. Your basic anatomy looks like this. You have a cell membrane here. I'm trying to outline it in red. Here's the cell membrane. Okay, the cell membrane is this outer edge here. Okay. This out here is the 
extracellular fluid here. And this is the intracellular fluid here. Now notice that these, this, these are kind of like projections of the cell membrane from the body of the cell outside. Inside of them, there are stacks of cytoskeleton. Now, some of these microvilli, the cytoskeleton they have inside of them is microfilaments. The cytoskeleton inside of cilia or flagelli is microtubules. And microtubules means movement. You can actually see movement there. So um, what I'd like to do is just really quickly look at these three tips of organelles, microvilli, cilia, and flagelli, and um, and um, uh, discuss them uh, real quickly. So I tried to make these three cells, well, this cell and this cell, I tried to make them look exactly the same size. And I labeled the cell membrane, cytoplasm, the nucleus, and then here's the little microvilli on the surface, little tiny hair-like extensions. Here are cilia, longer. Now, this is a sperm, of course, and it has a nucleus that I'm making it look about the same size as these other nuclei. But of course, it has a completely different looking cell. It has a cell membrane here and cell membrane that surrounds this mid-piece or neck. It surrounds this tail. And, and what I was saying is, look, all of these three have folded membrane and then they have cytoskeleton inside them. Well, when we look at microvilli or cilia, we can see that pretty easily. All right, so this is a cell here. That's a mitochondria. These are microvilli on its surface. And we can't really see the cytoskeleton in here because it hasn't been, it really hasn't been stained for cytoskeleton. So let's just see. This is a little collection um, that I put together. Oh, you know what? This is cilia. This is microvilli. This certainly shows you that the cilia are many times longer than microvilli. Uh, well, this one's this one here wasn't too bad. There's some uh, staining here that would help us see how cytoskeleton that's here inside the cell is actually extending up into these filaments. I, I don't know. It reminds me a little bit as if you could take a bunch of stalks of spaghetti and stick them in the um, in the fingers of a glove. You would sort of have something that looks a little similar to this. I, I have a model like that. It's locked in my classroom at Pima. This one, really nice. Okay, These, again, are microvilli. And so you can see that they're sticking up off the surface. This is about one micrometer. So this is a pretty high enlargement. This is a electron micrograph. But take a look down here how you can see this cytoskeleton and how it's basically going up inside these filaments to support it. I mean, that's what its job is to do, is to make these microvilli stick up off the edge of the cell Oh my gosh, look at this cell. Gotta show you this cell. This is one of my favorite cells in the body. It's a goblet cell. You see this cell here? This is a cell that makes mucus. This is all pre-mucus right here. And the actual top of this cell will rupture open and the pre-mucus will spill out. This is in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine of a mouse. And look at the magnification, 3,500 times. So that's pretty magnified. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting diverted. Um, I think I was able to show you um, some uh, pictures of 
that. Now, um, yeah, I was able to show you some okay pictures of cytoskeleton and all that. So here I am back to current slide. Okay. So microvilli, cilia, flagella. The smallest of these microvilli, they're about, about one micrometer tall. The medium sized of these are cilia. They're about 10 micrometers tall. And flagelli or flagellum is the longest of all. It's usually around 30 micrometers. Now, I mean, for what it's worth, um, whenever you talk about vil microvilli, you always use the plural because you'd never see one microvillus. You see many microvilli. Cilia, same thing. This is the plural form because you don't see one cilium, you see lots of cilia. But in the case of flagellum, the main cell that we're gonna mention that's flagellated is a sperm cell and a normal typical sperm cell only has one tail. That's why I use the singular form here, flagellum. Okay, so one flagellum. And, and flagelli are the longest of these three. Microvilli are non-mobile. They just stick up off the surface of the cell. But both cilia and flagelli are mobile. They can actually whip around in order to do something. Well, if it's a sperm, you know why it whips around. It creates a swimming motion, and that swimming motion allows it to swim. Um, you can find sperm in the reproductive tracts of men in their sperm ducts. And again, under the appropriate and completely consensual romantic circumstances, you might find them in the female reproductive tract. But I got to tell you something interesting about sperm. They cannot swim when they're inside a male. They cannot swim when they're inside the male's reproductive tracts. There are millions of them packed tightly together. This is, um, there's no ability to social distance when you're a sperm. So you can't be whipping this tail around and, and, uh, and damaging uh, and killing other sperm nearby. So sperm are actually paralyzed when they're inside the man's body. They don't get to start swimming until they're outside the man's body. And if they're inside the woman's body and they are suddenly there, they're going to start swimming like crazy, but they've never really swum before. And that's kind of amazing. Now, their function is to make a sperm swim. Cilia, their function is to move stuff around outside the cell. So just for example, if you're a cell and you're anchored in place and you have cilia and they move like this, they're not gonna move the cell anywhere. They're just gonna move whatever's over here, right? Like they're gonna create a current in the extracellular fluid if they're arranged that way. So when would you want a current in the extracellular fluid? Well, one reason could be that you want to push sperm out of the sperm ducts of the male. You want to gently move them out because they can't swim. Another reason is you might want to gently move an egg from the ovary down the oviduct towards the uterus. Another reason is you might want to move particles that you've inhaled into your sinuses or into your lungs. You might want to move those particles out of the body or their mucus has captured those particles. You might want to move that mucus out of the body. Um, there's lots of places you might want movement like that. And when you want movement like that in the extracellular fluid, then you're going to want cilia. And they're found throughout the body. They're found in the reproductive tract. They're found a lot in the respiratory tract, the sinus tracts, because that's where they're going to be moving mucus to capture, you know, that's moving particles that have been captured. Mucus, among other things, it's like flypaper. And when you inhale, stuff gets stuck on it and it agglomerates it. Is that a word? You know, I actually have sometimes suggested, maybe here even, that my allergies might actually help me when it comes to COVID-19 because I'm constantly draining out of my nose, as if you didn't know, because I'm constantly blowing my nose. Uh, but that constant drainage will carry away particles. And, um, and so if I inhaled some COVID-19, probably gonna get stuck in that mucus before it gets to look at any of my cells. And then there's a good chance that's hopefully not gonna just drip out of my nose, but I'll blow it out of my nose. And now the virus is here and I can just 
even in the trash, and it's all covered with mucus and all that. So thank you, mucus. Thank you, goblet cells, because I think they're protecting me about, against COVID-19. At least I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to support that as a hypothesis. That's all. It's just a hypothesis. could be a horrible one. Right? But anyway, if you're stuck in place and you move your cilia, it moves whatever's out here. But you know what? There are organisms that have cilia on them that are um, mobile organisms that use cilia to swim. And I'm just going to put it right here. Paramecium, probably. Paramecium. Here we go. Let's see it. Oh, my gosh. Look. Now, that is a great video of paramecium. Do you see the cilia on its surface? Paramecia are a kind of um, a kind of protists that are commonly called um, ciliated protists. And they're ciliated because their entire outer body is covered with cilia. And as you can see, they're pretty adept at using that cilia, pretty adept at using that cilia to swim. I'll run it one more time, eight seconds. Really cool. I'm going to grab this link. Uh-oh. All right, bye-bye, YouTube. Anyway, you saw um, how, I, how, how, how a paramecium can swim using um, their cilia. I wish there was somewhere I could embed that video here. There must be. Maybe not. Oh, well. Um, Uh, I'm so, uh, me again, I'm so jealous that when I was a student, I did not have um, access to YouTube. It's because it didn't even exist. Oh my, imagine this. The internet didn't even exist then. That's just crazy. There was no internet. How could that be? Anyway, so uh, I'm almost done with this and I'm almost done with my slideshow. And I'm um, sorry, last thing. Here's the ciliated protist thing down here, right? So what is cilia? To create movement in the extracellular fluid or extracellular particles. That's what ECF or EC stands for, extracellular fluid or extracellular particles. We find them in the respiratory tract. We find them in the reproductive tract. We find them in the sperm ducts. Movable cilia. Microvilli, remember they're non-mobile. So what good are they? We put microvilli on our cells to increase the surface area. That's what that stands for. Let me write while we're, I'm thinking about it. I think it'd be good for me to write down real quickly. So ECF equals extra cellular fluid. And uh, SA equals surface area. Whoops. Surface area.
just so that that you understand what some of these uh, crazy abbreviations mean. So the purpose of microvilli is to increase the surface area of the cell for better absorption, to help the cell absorb something. It could be useful for absorbing water, could be useful for absorbing nutrients. It's very common to find microvilli in the small intestine, where one of the jobs of the small intestine is to pick up nutrients and to um, move them in the bloodstream. Uh, one of the jobs of the kidney tubules, our kidneys are made of millions of tubules. One of their jobs is to pick up water and return it to the blood. Our kidneys are such efficient water filters that they filter out something like 99% of our total blood. No, what am I saying? They will multiply multiple times. They will filter out multiple times our total blood volume in a day. Huh? Which means if you couldn't reclaim most of that water by reabsorbing it thanks to microvilli, then you would urinate yourself to death in an hour because these kidneys filter so much water. Okay, so I'm going to let leave this chart for you to study and to, you know, show it to your family at dinner and discuss it and all that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much almost done with this document because a lot of stuff is just a review of stuff we've already talked about, okay? And so just so you know that the rest of these pages are just for you to, oh, to look at them and enjoy, okay? So um, I'm going to go all the way to the, you know, quickly go all the way to the end, all this nice stuff labeled. Nucleus, nucleus, ribosomes, ribosomes. I don't know how I managed to get that on there. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endo. All of this is stuff that we've really talked about already. And so um, the bottom line is that this is just there for your review, okay? I got the cell membrane extension organelles there twice. That's fine. And... Um, got way too much stuff in this PowerPoint, but hey, I'd rather have too much stuff than too little stuff. And the last slide in here is the one designed to make you laugh. It's my drawing of a typical eukaryotic cell. Escape. Okay, this is cytology. I mean, this needs to be now uh, cytology, the cell theory, cells dot two, okay? So, uh, Right. And that's the one I'm going to re I'm going to repost this as soon as we are done in class today, which is soon. Um, all right. Is anybody still actually anybody still out there? I can't tell. Oh, quiz five key is. Yeah. Um, wait a minute. Did I post the quiz five key already? I guess not. Huh? Sorry, I will post the uh, quiz five key. I will post the quiz five key ASAP. I'm writing it down. Big note here, quiz five key. You bet, I get to work on that right away. Um, earlier, someone had a question about the lab. So let me pull up the lab, just for fun. I gotta go back over here and I gotta sign in again because even though I don't get this, I mean, I'm basically online the whole time why doesn't the computer system recognize that? I'm doing something attached to the to our you know email system. That's how I get to the meeting. And um, what I'm going to do is go on to D2L, and I'm going to look for that forest. Oh, there it is. And I'm going to go to content. You're right, quiz five key isn't there. 
I'm going to um, right here. I'm going to repost this. These both of these are ones that just need to be removed, but I, I don't want to get distracted. Here's the lab. I click on the lab. It looks like nothing has happened because the lab is up here. It's a Word document, which may, is kind of nice. And um, I, of course, have another formats, and you probably could download it, print it, and all that kind of stuff. Somebody earlier said they had a question about it, so can I try oh, and yeah. answer it? That was me. It was just a really quick question. I was, um, sure. I was just wondering, is there um, a specific temperature the water needs to be when we put the gummy bears in them? Well, um, unless I'm wrong, I think that it's asking you to, when you put the gummy bears in water, to refrigerate the water, uh -huh. okay? And so um, what that mostly means, yeah, look at here. Let's see. Yeah, because it said, I mean, you need a cup of like the sugar solution and then the water yeah now that's when you're making up either a sugar or salt yeah. solution um and so uh i'm pretty sure i mean and this is um beginning the experiment da, 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 in the refrigerator for 20 so bottom line right. is, is i guess okay. it doesn't make any difference well, I, here's what they're saying though is that look you make a warm sugar solution let's say you warm the water up like it's talking about right here Mm -hmm. It asks you to warm the water up. Um, uh, where was it? Right here. A solution of table sugar and water. Slowly add one cup to one cup. Boiling water. Okay, look. Here's the thing. If you drop a gummy bear in boiling sugar water, it's gonna Peter, will be, Peter will be at your door. Or what is it? <laughs> um, uh, pe people for the ethical treatment of its pet, I guess. Anyway. Yeah, it's people for the ethical treatment of gummy animals. No, it will dissolve the gummy bear. That's what it is. So that's why it says you need to chill it in your refrigerator, okay? And then, because you don't want to drop one of these gummy bears into um, boiling water. I mean, if I thought about using uh, lobsters for this, but I thought it would be too expensive. Anyway, but the bottom line is, is that you want to refrigerate the water ahead of time so that it's not going to dissolve the gummy bear. And then you're going to leave the gummy bears in the solution in your refrigerator. So what would that mean temperature-wise? My refrigerator is about 42, 43, 44 degrees. But I wouldn't worry about it. We're just going to call it refrigerator temperature. Okay. Great question, then, though. Thank you. Sorry. Um, one, okay, but we can... So we can use the the syrup instead of the solution, right? The Cairo syrup, or the the agave or whatever. Oh, that's right. So you, yeah, I mean. So we can when, use that instead. Well, I don't know. Hold on one second. Okay. We can use maple syrup. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you can use same, maple just, syrup, okay. corn syrup, Cairo syrup, agave nectar sugar solution which is what you're going to make if you want to make it or you can gotcha. use one of these other solutions i don't know which one I, you know what i ha haven't done this lab with multiple different things when i did this lab in a class we had salt solution and it seemed to work really well but you know all of these solutions imitation maple syrup corn syrup carrot syrup agave nectar or a sugar solution that you make I mean, this is pretty thick this is one cup of table sugar and one cup of water all of these are going to be um, a, a thicky, a thick sugar solution. And that's what we want to put the gummy bear in and see what happens to it. You gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, those are, uh, I, believe me, I appreciate those questions because I know if you, if you have that question, then somebody else has that question too. Okay. So good, 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 good. Um, all right, so I can't believe it, but it's Thursday. I am going to be doing mass grading over the weekend, mass grading. So expect, you know, double check your D2 grade book on Sunday and you should see some changes. I'm going to be doing a bunch of mass grading. And I just apologize that it's taken me so long. I'm just kind of overwhelmed with stuff to do. But I'm going to be doing a bunch of mass grading. I mean, I did try and do a bunch of grading since yesterday with when the when the exam was due and all that 
Um, some of that's updated. If yours isn't updated, I mean, if you've got a score like 35, then I haven't updated it, right? It's just graded to multiple choice. And then there is a brand new quiz there. I will get the quiz five key up as quick as I can get it up, which is, should be pretty fast. And, um, and we'll pick it right up here on Monday. We're going to move from cells to, um, to straight from these specialized cell stuff. We're going to sort of simultaneously be thinking about membranes, membrane transport, and tissues at the same time. So it's going to be a really busy, busy week next week, okay? Because I'm trying not to extend the summer school session into October, okay? So I've sort of got a plan for how not to do that. All right. So if there's no other questions, then I'm done. I have one real quick one. Go ahead. Um, with regards to the uh, exam, then you're still apparently grading and stuff. Uh, right. Will we be able to see exactly which questions we have missed? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, does, does somebody else who knows more about D2L, can you tell me whether you can go back and look at the exam and see what you missed? I think I, you might be able to make it that way, but it doesn't default to that. Yeah, it doesn't default. I think, like, I've had um, classes where it, that's been an option, like, but it, it, I think, like, yeah, like you said, it has to be right. on your end that you enable that. Okay. Then I'm going to study that, right? Because I don't, I, honestly, I don't know how to do that. So, so the question is, how can you see wrong answers? Which, uh, you know, honestly, that is absolutely, um, that's absolutely something valuable to be able to see. I mean, when I post quiz keys, then you can at least look at the quiz key and go, oh, yeah, when I compare this to what I answered, I don't think it's see why I lost a point or two there. But, you know, with multiple choice, it'd be good to know what the multiple choice answers were. Yeah. And and that's something that I just have to look at that document. I'm getting better at it, at least. Uh, but I need to look at that document and figure out um, you know, that it's tough. You should see, well, you may, some, most people in this, they're smarter than me. So you're going to look at, you would look at the document and probably go, oh, no problem. Click, 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 click. Oh, but you, when you look, when I look at that document, all I see is about 35 different things I could check on, check off, do this, do that. Do I make it this way? Do I do it that way? Ah, so I, it takes me um, a little while, um, you know, coming from dinosaur land that, um, to figure out exactly how to make things appear right and not screw something else up. That's the thing. So believe me, I'm going to look at that and I'm going to um, try and figure out. Now, the other alternative would be for me to um, post a key, just a separate posted key that shows the answers to the multiple choices, which would be fine. Just need to figure that out. And then uh, same thing with the short answers. I, I'm going to see if maybe that's another option that I could just sort of download the um, exam and and post that so people could look at it and go, oh, okay, I missed question number 25 because I answered it this way and um, it, you know, and, and here was the correct answer or whatever. Okay? Believe me, I'm going to work on it. All right. Thank you. That's all I can do. I believe me, I, I couldn't do it right this moment by any means. All right, so everybody, have a safe weekend. Uh, you want? I would start on the gummy bear lab, you know, and get your Cairo syrup and your agave syrup all lined up or whatever. And you want to start working on the gummy bear lab? That would be great. And um, we come back on Monday. We we're pretty much done with cell organelles and all that. But please take a look at that PowerPoint because there's parts of it I didn't even show you that um, are worth looking at big giant PowerPoint. I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't see how it's any different than me saying read chapter three through five in the textbook on the cell organelles. So except it's probably shorter and sweeter than a textbook would, would which would be, would be required to put a whole bunch of words into things. Okay. Um, where's the PowerPoint? Is it under um, documents or do I have to go under? under it's under contents. So let me go back here and i think this is going to take me back it's in this table of contents way down at the bottom there's like 30 documents here so see here's where you start to see 
uh, basic chemistry four, base types of um, basic chemistry four. I posted the types of chemical reactions thing. Um, here's, here's, this is a PowerPoint on the cell theory. The, there's, here's the um, cell organelle PowerPoints. And believe me, the very first thing I do when I stop class in a few minutes is I'm going to post the brand new PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, actually, you know what? Sorry. This cell organelles, these are the actual documents. Here's the PowerPoint. Okay. okay I'm going to replace you. that with the brand new one. And that one's going to say cytology two. Okay. It's the updated version of it. All I right. Have a question for you too. You. Sure. Go ahead. I'm looking on the DTL homepage, like just a right. normal where the rest of the assignments are posted at. And right. I'm not seeing the assignment. Last one I see on there is the pH one. On the D2L page? Yes. And the one you go under assignments, how you get to it with the green with the green forest. Yeah. All right. So let's go. I'm gonna go up here to assessments, assignments. Mm -hmm. And PAO, oh, but you know what? It's true. I need to, um, I've got the pH, excuse me, I've got the gummy bear lab in table of contents. I need to put the gummy bear lab here too. Okay. And I will. Thanks for telling me about that, Kendall. Because I've been but looking I, to see if I've missed anything. I'm like, why isn't it here? I have completely spaced that out. And it's no, believe me, it's, it's not a huge to do it's just uh, um, I, I, I'm, I am very appreciative that you pointed it out to me um, because I just you know it's just one of those balls that I dropped because I mean I posted it and I'm like great it's posted but then I realized well it's actually an assignment and it needs to be um, it needs to be you know attached to it so that's no big deal. I mean, I can do that in a second. In fact, I'm actually doing it right now. Thanks so much, though, for um, pointing that out because uh, I just, it's just one of those things that I, one, one little step that I didn't take. Okay. And so there we go. That it's uploading now, and I will also correct that PowerPoint too. Okay. Hey everybody, thanks for coming to class today. Uh, I know it's wet and rainy and everything out, but I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate the hard work that everybody is doing, um, and I um, hope you'll have a safe weekend and do all the normal. Do every, do everything right. Okay, wear a mask and do social distancing and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Hey, Steven. Um, Thanks. See you on Monday at 1 15. Have a great weekend. I'll be grading, grading, grading. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Oh, I finally did one. Oh, I